Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second annual research conference of the Atlantic Council's Freedom and Prosperity Center. Uh, we are joined um, here in Washington by over 60 people from 34 countries and from five continents, and joining us virtually um, are 800 people from 75 countries on six continents. Allow me to reintroduce to, uh, to you the uh, Freedom and Prosperity Center. Uh, we explore the relationship between the freedom and prosperity of countries. And as a foundational element um, to our work um, are two country indexes. A freedom index with sub-indexes for economic, political, and legal freedom, and a comprehensive prosperity um, index with six dimensions of prosperity. These two indexes use 100,000 data points to cover 164 countries over 28 years. Our unbiased, data-driven research finds strong indications that the surest path to prosperity is by way of increased freedom. This is an important message at any time but particularly in today's sobering time in international relations. Fred Kempe, the Atlantic Council CEO, publishes periodically articles under the heading Inflection Points. In his January column, he quotes Bob Gates, former Secretary of Defense, who argued that the current threat to global order today is the greatest in decades and perhaps ever. In the same column, Fred also refers to a recent article by Professor Hal Brands, who finds parallels between the current international environment with aligned authoritarian, revisionist, and belligerent powers causing regional conflicts and tensions and the environment in the 1930s when the regional conflicts in those days resulted in global conflict. Today's leading authoritarian, revisionist, and belligerent powers are China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. They are aligned in wanting to append the current rules-based international orders, and they give each other support militarily, economically, and diplomatically. Russia in its invasion of Ukraine, in Iran's terrorist actions through proxies in the Middle East, and in China and North Korea's provocative actions at sea and by land in Asia. What is important to the work of our center is that the revisionist powers are also aligned ideologically. They are authoritarian regimes, and they propose to the global south an authoritarian development model. Their development vision is maybe best summarized in the words of President Xi Jinping, who said, you don't have to westernize to modernize. Put differently, they argue that countries don't need freedom to achieve prosperity. And our research and the research of many others contradicts this contention. I'm uh, confident, that our, confident that our conference today and the work of our center in general will shed more light on this important and timely question. <clears throat> Are economic, political, and legal freedoms necessary for durable prosperity? So what are we offering? today. Uh, three things. First, panel discussions. Um, the, there is a common theme in the uh, discussions that we have. The common theme is based on the country atlas that uh, is available online for our center. Um, we invited uh, 20 distinguished scholars uh, to write 20 chapters. The scholars come from, from uh, 18 different countries. And uh, of these 20 scholars, 15 are participating in today's conference. And I will leave to our moderators to introduce um, themselves and the panelists. But I must single out Kim Reed, distinguished fellow of our center and former CEO of Exim Bank, who contributed so much to, um, to our conference that we could consider her a co-organizer. Uh, second, we offer a research showcase. Joseph Lemoine, director of our center, will give an overview later this morning of what we have in our research showcase. But I'll give you the summary. We've selected um, seven research projects that are funded by our center. 
and uh, the respective scholars coming from Mexico, Spain, France, Romania, and the United States who wrote these studies um, are available in the boardroom to answer questions and to show you their work so far. Uh, thirdly, we offer conversations. People will be able to ask questions using the QR code of the panelists. And we have conversations also in the breaks to our program. I would like now to recognize a few of the participants um, in person with us today. Um, it has been the policy of our center that is only two years old to have low overhead, to have a small number of people working in our offices here at the Atlantic Council but we, to form deep partnership with partnerships with like-minded organizations who have been um, doing similar business, similar work for a long time, and then we can leverage on their reputation internationally and their presence internationally. And two of these organizations are really central to our work, the Acton Institute and the Atlas Network, and we have representatives from both of them with us today. And I also have to recognize the Templeton Foundation. We have with us today Heather Templeton Dill, the CEO, and two of its senior leaders, Amy Pru and Michael Bloom. And we have great plans to do wonderful new things with the Templeton Foundation. Also, I would like to recognize the, the support that we got from the Heritage Foundation. Um, Heritage had produced for 25 years a highly regarded and widely used economic freedom index, and we were just starting out. We got great advice from Heritage. And um, we have with us today from Heritage, uh, Spencer Kretien, who is Deputy Director of Heritage's Project 2025. We've also developed a close working relationship with the International Republican Institute, and we have with us from them, um, Patrick Quirk, Vice President. He has a great title, a great title. Listen to this. Vice President for Strategy, Innovation, and Impact. I'm very jealous for the title. Um, and several of his colleagues, um, as well as um, uh, Lauren Van Metre, Director of Peace, Climate, and Democracy Project at the National Democratic Institute. And we also have with us Mike Regas, Vice Chair of the America First Policy Institute's Transition Project, a former senior official in the Office of Management and Budget. And a special welcome for the second conference in a row to Mohamed Farid, Senator in Egypt, current Senator in Egypt. And um, he's a panelist in the Middle East, um, in the Middle East uh, panel. We also have with us five members of our center's advisory council, and we are very grateful that they took the time to be with us. Michael Desombre, former ambassador to Thailand. Vanessa Rubio Marquez, former Mexican senator and vice minister. And Matt Kronick, who is also the senior director of the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center, that we are very proud of. Um, last but not least, um, two valuable guests who have traveled a very long distance to be with us. Ken Sharp and uh, his wife, Joanna, who came all the way from Zimbabwe, and they also brought more reinforcements. Their daughter, Tatiana, is with us today. But she came just from the United States West Coast, so that's close, so it doesn't count as big effort, but still an effort to recognize. And we also have representatives from several embassies, um, and I'm going to read them in alphabetical order, France, Japan, Poland, Philippines, and Singapore. And it is uh, my great pleasure to also always recognize in gatherings like this, the two people I refer to as the uh, co-founders of our center. The intellectual father uh, of our center is Michael Fish, also great supporter of our center. He's the chairman of our advisory council. And it was Michael who had the idea that countries that want more prosperity should increase their freedom. 
and we are very grateful for continued guidance, especially since his day job as uh, founder and CEO of American Securities, one of the US largest and most respected invest investment funds is quite demanding, but he finds time to talk to us. And the other co-founder is, um, is our CEO, Fred Kempe, who looked at the work of our center when we were just a project within another center, and he thought that we represent the values and the, uh, the principles of the Atlantic Council. And he decided to create us a center, which gives us a terrific platform for our work. And with that, I would like to invite um, Fred Kempe, our CEO, to be at the next speaker. Uh, as, as Michael Fish and I both know, uh, uh, Dan tends to give credit to others when he should take the credit for himself. Uh, the founding senior director of the Freedom and Prosperity Center, let's give a round of applause for Dan Negron. And, and his remarkable deputy, Joseph Lemoyne, and just an incredible team. Uh, so thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, the Freedom of Prosperity Center, as Dan said, was founded just two years ago. And as he said, thanks to the vision and the generosity of Michael Fish, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, uh, but in, in just two years, uh, not only has the center become one of the proudest things that we do at the Atlantic Council, it has become essential to our mission of shaping the global future together. Uh, I, I, I can't even imagine us pursuing that mission any longer without this center at the, uh, uh, at the fulcrum of actually measuring how are we doing uh, in the world uh, in terms of freedom and prosperity. Um, the center aims to increase the prosperity of the poor and marginalized everywhere, and in particular in developing countries. Uh, we believe the best way to defend freedom and prosperity is to share the evidence of their benefits. And that's what the uh, center does. It's an evidence-based uh, center. The indexes that the center produces show that freedom, democracy, open markets, and the rule of law are essential ingredients for true long-term prosperity. And this is an unbiased, fact-based argument against these autocratic models. Um, the center has done a terrific job of producing and advertising its research with key stakeholders in the US and Europe. But what makes its work even more impactful is how it's fostering a new generation of global, uh, global leaders in the Global South. Today, at this uh, research conference, we'll go on an intellectual world tour, uh, and we'll get the chance to listen to recognized experts in all regions of the world, and Dan has given you the names of many of them. The Financial Times uh, calls 2024, uh, quote, the most intense and cacophonous 12 months of democracy the world has seen since the idea was minted more than 2,500 years ago, end quote. Foreign policy says this year uh, we'll see a global battle between democracy and autocracy play out literally at the polls. What's true is that some 2 billion people uh, will vote in 2024, so that's about half of the world population. Uh, it represents more than 60% of global gross domestic product in elections across 70 countries. We will not have this group of important elections coming together all in one year again until 2048. At the same time, we're confronting intractable wars in Europe and the Middle East and tensions that could escalate in Asia. Uh, China wants to replace the United States as the leading global power and to push uh, the U.S. out of the Western Pacific. Meanwhile, Russia wants to retake territory and influence lost with Soviet collapse. Uh, we've just faced the second uh, year of its um, uh, war of aggression uh, on uh, Ukraine, which is really a war against us all. Uh, in the Middle East, Iran and its proxies, among them Hamas, the Houthis, Hezbollah, are bent on um, uh, the annihilation of Israel and are struggling for regional dominance against the Gulf monarchies in the United States. So there's a perfect storm of geopolitical tensions in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, coming together at a time of electoral ferment and challenges to democracy across the world, 
also at a time when there is a competition for the commanding heights of technological change and where the technologies, whether it's quantum computing or whether it's artificial intelligence or whether it's bioengineering, are also going to force us to come to terms with a great many uh, questions in uh, all in rapid fire. In times like this, it's good to take a step back and reflect, as we'll do today. Reflect on where we are, uh, where we were, and also on where we want to go most of all. And that's exactly what we'll do today on our Intellectual World Tour. We'll discuss the data, the facts, the research prepared by the Freedom and Prosperity Center that will guide us forward. Uh, and, uh, and we have top economists and policymakers in this room uh, that will uh, guide us to help better understand what we, what we have to do to get back on track, defend democracy, advance freedom, and achieve prosperity. Um, none of this would be possible without Michael Fish, founder and CEO of American Securities, member of the Atlantic Council's Executive Committee, and chairman of the Freedom and Prosperity Center Advisory Council. His vision and support have made possible the work of the uh, Freedom and Prosperity Center. Uh, to be truthful, when he brought us this audacious vision, uh, I guess even three, maybe even a little more than three years ago when we first started working on this, uh, I wasn't quite sure whether we could measure up to his vision, whether, whether we should, could measure up to what he hoped to achieve uh, through these indexes. Uh, we're only two years in, but I'm very proud of what we've done so far, but none of it would have done if you hadn't challenged us in the first place, Michael. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn the floor to you. Oh, thank you, Fred. Thank you, Dan, for those kind words. I'm not deserving of most of them. Um, Dan incubated and led this uh, vision. Uh, spectacularly for the last three years. Um, and Fred um, supported it and enabled it, um, and I'm deeply grateful to both of you. Um, so sometimes things are, uh, things happen which, you know, um, geez, what a coincidence. So I have this service which sends me little Bible quotes every day, and today's quote is, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. That is uh, so consistent with what the Freedom and Prosperity Center is here today to do, to use our liberty to serve one another, uh, because every time freedom fails, economies falter, the data shows. And when the economy falters, of course, that falls most on the poor and the marginalized in every country. And so what the center is trying to do is improve the lives of people around the world, particularly the poor and the marginalized. And so um, the research has proven this, and I am so deeply proud of all of the researchers that have worked with Dan and Joseph and all of our partners uh, outside of the Atlantic Council who are contributing, and you see that in a lot of the written materials and articles that have been put forth. Um, we've made great progress, I think, because of Dan and the team in accomplishing the mission providing data and facts, real research and empirical support um, for a notion which has proven the case that when there is more personal freedom, there is better economic outcomes. Um, and the center's annual reports and data and indexes are available on the website, and I encourage everyone to look at them. They're, they're really, really cool, and they're starting to get um, animated uh, by people who picked this up. There was a really great YouTube that's come about where it basically has all the work that Dan and Joseph and the team have done, but puts it in a terrific marketing package uh, to a whole bunch of new, new viewers to this, to, to get this, this word out. So I like to say uh, countries that go to elections, um, go with f the voting population, ultimately will have full knowledge about the choices and the economic consequences of those choices and policies. Um, we recently published another of our many reports that talks about, uh, as Dan mentioned, this false narrative that has been promulgated that authoritarian, authoritarian governments um, are performing well for their people. It's not true. Um, you can see, uh, particularly in the case of Russia, much in the news, all of the Russian Federation started at the same place. Um, and then when Russia broke apart in 1991, you have what has gone on in Putin's Russia and the former Soviet Union states and freedom has been repressed 
in Putin's Russia and in the, formia, in the former uh, Soviet states, um, they have outperformed. And as the freedom has outperformed, so has the economy. They are related, and uh, this is what the, the data shows. And so um, I seriously recommend this research to you and commend Dan and Joseph and the team and all of our other supporters and scholars. And I'm very much looking forward to the rest of today and learning as I always do when I come to the Atlantic Council. So congratulations on another terrific conference, Dan. Um, that's my, my official opening and gratitude for everybody being here and excitement for the center. Uh, now, it is my second uh, honor, uh, second duty today and my honor to introduce the first contributor to our conference. Professor Darren Asimogo contributed to the conference and previously recorded remarks which are about to be played. Um, uh, and he wrote the foreword to our atlas, and he is one of the most uh, special economists out there. A Turkish-born American who's taught at MIT uh, since 1993, uh, currently the Elizabeth and James Killian Professor of Economics. James Killian was a former president of MIT back in the 50s, so this is a really important professorship. Um, and uh, he received, what I'm sure all of you know, the James Bates Clark Medal in 2005, which is the medal given to the, one of the best up-and-coming great economists. It's a very sought-after and prestigious um, academic award. Uh, born to Armenian parents in Istanbul, he received his BA at York University in 1989 and a PhD from the London School of Economics um, in 1992. Lectured at LSE for a year before uh, taking his position up at MIT. He is best known for his work on political economy and authored hundreds, I mean, it's amazing, hundreds of papers, many of them with longtime contributors, uh, Simon Johnson and James A. Robinson. With Robinson, he co-authored the book Economic Origins of Dictatorships and Democracy in 2006 and Why Nations Fail in 2012, the latter an influential book on the role that institutions play in shaping nations' economic outcomes, and it received wide scholarly and media attention. He's described as a centrist, which is very consistent with the Atlantic Council as Fred has created it. What are the facts and get to better outcomes? Uh, and he believes in a regulated uh, market economy. He regularly comments on political issues, economic inequality, and a variety of uh, specific policies. He is ranked third behind Paul Krugman and Greg Manku in the list of favorite living economists under 60. Now, most economists aren't in the, on these lists, but, you know, he, this is really big stuff to be number three. Um, in a 2020 uh, survey. And so it's a great pleasure to introduce him live to you today. It's my great pleasure to be able to join the Atlantic Council of Freedom and Prosperity Research Conference, albeit remotely. I'm sorry I cannot be there with you. But the conference is on a central topic for our future and one that I have been thinking a lot about and I want to share uh, what I think the lessons of uh, about 30 years of research that I've been doing on this together with Jim Robinson and other co-authors, and in particular, the basic ideas from the two books that Jim and I published, Why Nations Fail and The Narrow Corridor. And I'm going to focus more on liberal democracy, uh, and but I'll draw the links between liberal democracy and prosperity centrally as I go along. Today, we live in an age that you can characterize as a crisis of democracy. In 1960, less than a third of countries in the world were democratic, but times were changing. And a couple of years later, more than about 10 years later, the major dictatorships of Southern Europe started collapsing. And that was followed by a broader movement towards democracy, which the political scientist Samuel Huntington called the third way of democracy. But a turning point was the 1989 collapse of the Berlin Wall and the beginning of the collapse of the Soviet Union, when the political scientist Francis Fukuyama declared an end of history and victory of liberal capitalism. By 2000, this third wave has indeed changed the landscape for democracy around the world, about 60% of countries are democratic now. But since then, we see a very remarkable pattern. So according to the Freedom House, every year since 2006, there have been more countries that have taken steps back from democracy than towards democracy, either collapsing of democratic regimes or democracies themselves getting weaker. 
This is not just a phenomenon of the developing world. If you look at the United States with a more granular measure for democracy by the varieties of democracy data set, which I think has now become a, uh, a leading source for people to, uh, to look at what's going on with the quality of democracy, you see that many developed nations, industrialized nations are also experiencing worsening of their scores of democracy, including Sweden, including France, but most notably democ democracy in the United States has taken a big hit, as you can see from the VDEM score since 2000, the mid 2010s. Latin America, where the third wave was perhaps the strongest, you can see the big improvements in democracy in countries such as Chile, Peru, uh, Argentina, and Colombia, but now in many of them, you see the opposite trend. But to me, actually, even more concerning is not just these scores of democracy, which mean a lot for the lives of hundreds of millions of people, but also people's support for democracy. Many surveys, including the World Value Survey and the European Value Survey, ask people their views about democracy in a variety of questions. And here I'm providing a summary of those questions. And this is, again, the industrialized world. You see led by the United States, a huge worsening in the scores for support for democracy, but it's not unique to the United States. The UK, uh, Italy, and France, you have less support for democracy today than you did before. Some people saying that they don't mind if it's a dictator or an army, or they are reporting that they think uh, democratic institutions are not working. This is even more visible in some Latin American countries, for example, Peru, uh, or Mexico, Brazil, and even Argentina, you have a big drop in support for democracy. And of course, where support for democracy collapses, democratic regimes, democratic institutions often follow. So this is a big concern. And as I'm going to try to explain in a second, if democracy collapses, then liberty and prosperity will follow as well. So I want to then first turn to one idea that unfortunately has gained a lot of traction in some popular media, that democracy uh, is doing badly because democracy is not good for economic growth. So you can think perhaps what's going on here is that democratic regimes are not good at tackling the economic challenges of the day, and that's why people are turning their back on democracy. Well, this is not a new idea either. Many philosophers, going back to Socrates, uh, Plato, Aristotle, and many uh, uh, European thinkers of uh, the 18th and 19th centuries, were hostile to democracy. And controversies continue to the present. Many uh, political scientists and economists have claimed that political rights are not good for democracy, at least are neutral for, for, for economic growth. And, uh, and, and this has become more of a refrain in popular media, especially fueled by you know, China and Russia and other authoritarian countries. Well, I have devoted a lot of my career to investigating this issue, and my conclusion is the exact opposite, that there is overwhelming evidence that democracies are actually good for growth, and in fact, they are good for high-quality growth. So whatever is going on, is not because democracies are incapable of generating or supporting growth. It's something else. So here, uh, you know, you can, of course, as uh, George Bernard Shaw noted, you can tell lots of lies with statistics. So you can compare China to Switzerland and say, look, you know, China is growing faster and hence democracy must be bad for growth. But if you're going to do anything reasonable, you want to compare apples to apples, so look at the same countries over time as their political regimes change. And here is the raw data for that, which I think leaves no doubt about what's going on in the post-war era. And the same is true, by the way, for the 19th century and early 20th century as well. Uh, so here what I'm doing is I'm showing you the GDP per capita uh, across different countries that have started the sample as non-democracies and choosing here for simplicity a binary measure of democracy zero one and then i am tracing those that have later become democratic so for a country that becomes democratic zero is the year in which they become a democracy and i normalize time so that i'm comparing 
uh, this country to other non-democracies that stayed non-democracies in the same year. And you can see a very clear pattern. After they democratize, countries for a while don't have an economic crisis, but they're not growing very fast as they're adjusting to the new democratic regime. But in about seven, eight years time, growth picks up. And by uh, the year 25 after democratization, regardless of actually, you know, this is not on a selected sample, so it's not just countries that have successfully consolidated the more democracy, but after 25 years, democratization is associated with about a 20% increase in GDP per capita. You see a drop before democratization, and this is reflecting the fact that oftentimes democratization doesn't happen because dictators say, okay, I'm going to establish a parliamentary system. They collapse in the midst of economic or other types of mismanagement, at least in some of the cases, and that's why there's a drop before zero. If you do statistical work and control for a variety of factors, you get the same conclusion. Uh, uh, there is now no pre-trend before democratization. So those pre-trends are all due to predictable things. And then there's a slow growth process that starts and then accelerates around year 15 or so. So at least in the post-war era, there is no doubt that democracy within country is associated with faster, better growth performance. Now, it's not just growth that we care about. Prosperity depends on how that growth is distributed within society. And one of the uh, aspects that we care about is who gets access to education, who gets access to public goods, who gets access to health care. Well, if you look into greater detail, you see that democracies are good for all of these things too. Democracies tax more, redistribute more, they invest more in education, they invest more in uh, public goods, and they invest more in health care. And here I'm showing you what happens, for example, with one of the worst aspects of health problems in many countries, uh, child mortality. So there's a big drop in child mortality after democratization. And then again, if you look into the, uh, this in greater detail, you will conclude that this is most likely a causal effect of democracy. So why is democracy in crisis? I would say four reasons. One, while democracy has the capability of delivering better growth, higher quality growth, it has failed in one dimension, and that's inequality. And that's not because of an inherent failure of democracy, but it's because our democratic politicians have not acted decisively on inequality and they've been too enamored by technological change not to do anything about its inequality implications and they have been too much beholden to rich lobbies. And perhaps they have also not dealt with globalization the right way and I'll also talk about social media and new technologies in China, and I'll bring it to a framework that can help us make sense of these issues. So let me show you some inequality facts. This is for the US. I'm plotting here the real wages, inflation adjusted wages for 10 demographic groups, men and women, uh, all the way from workers with without a high school degree up to workers with a college degree. And you see this period here before 1980 is broadly a shared prosperity pattern. The same is true in 1950s. The same is true in much of the industrialized world. Real wages were growing fast. Real incomes were growing fast. About 2.5% inflation adjusted every year. And this was shared that all demographic groups were benefiting from it. But then you see a sea change around 1980. Inequality now starts increasing, but more concerningly, a big drop in the real incomes of low education group. In the United States, recent history for which we have data, there has never been a pattern like this, a 40 year period in which real incomes have dropped like this. This is not just a US phenomenon. While lack of unions and minimum wages and uh, inequality and uh, you know, anti-inequality norms in the US is stronger than other industrialized nations. The same forces are around in other countries. And you see, for example, that the middle class has retrenched in many of the industrialized nations here. The, in red, I'm showing the middle third of occupations, you know, blue collar workers, clerical workers, sales, retail workers. All of those jobs have become less abundant in uh, almost all of the industrialized world. Inequality problem around the world is much more severe. The US is a very high inequality country, but even then 
the share of the <clears throat> top 1% is about 20%, just under 20% in the United States. It's much, much higher, almost 50% of uh, uh, income is captured by the richest people in parts of Latin America and parts of uh, Asia and some African countries, really staggering levels of uh, inequality. And some of these countries are supposedly democratic, but the democratic governments are not doing anything about this extreme level of inequality, including in the United States. You know, the United States has not adopted new redistributive measures, has not done anything to lessen the impact of the staggering levels of inequality increases that I showed earlier on. Now, inequality is often associated in these countries with an increase in globalization. It's also associated with technological changes. New technologies that have increased the demand for specialized skills and globalization that has also increased the same uh, demand and also created new opportunities for multinational companies are very much related to why inequality has increased in the United States and in some other industrialized nations. They are also linked to inequality in much of Latin America and Africa. Globalization has other effects on democracy. It creates population flows that are sometimes destabilizing. It creates mixing of cultures via uh, TV and other media that also may create backlash. I don't think we understand fully the effects of globalization, but as a statistical point of view, increases in globalization are often uh, followed by increased discontent in the population, some cultural uh, fault lines becoming deeper, and sometimes support for democracy declining. Technology, I think, is a really important part of the story, and a lot of my work has focused on how technology has changed inequality via automation, via its link to globalization. But technology has a direct effect on politics as well through surveillance, changing communication channels, and other types of activities that directly impact democratic participation. The 20th, 21st century is in some ways promising to be the century of surveillance. This is Tiananmen Square. It's unthinkable today that you could have the kinds of student protests that you saw in 1989 in Tiananmen Square. First, the Chinese state has tightened its grip, but everywhere you now have facial recognition cameras and other surveillance methods, both online and offline. And the social credit system in China, which has been rolled out in some of the provinces and, uh, and it's also being tried by the centralized state, is emblematic of this. But it would be a mistake to think that social media surveillance are only problems for authoritarian countries such as China and Russia. Social media, according to at least some empirical work and some accounts, has had a deep negative effect on democracy in the developed world, and surveillance type activities are growing. Data today, which has become a lifeblood of the modern economy, is hugely concentrated in the hands of a few gigantic tech companies. And uh, while it is reasonable that we should fear the Chinese Communist Party more than Google and Facebook. I think it would be a brazen attitude to say that only the Chinese Communist Party can, will misuse data and Google and Facebook that are becoming as big as uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, will not. So I think the way in which social media is changing communications, the way in which the internet and other AI tools are changing surveillance are also impacting uh, a democracy. But these two slides are about China, not just because it's emblematic of <clears throat> how these technologies can be misused, but China has become a beacon for authoritarianism. The Chinese Communist Party has uh, reached the conclusion that the only way it can survive in the medium term within China as an authoritarian center of power is also by convincing a broader public globally that democracy is not a good system. 
and this has been joined by Russia also. So China and Russia are spending money and resources in order to show the world that the authoritarian system works. It is more in line with certain cultural values. It is economically successful in the case of the Chinese emphasis and that democracy has weaknesses, democracy has bad sides, democracy fails in a number of dimensions. So this provides, I think, the background for why there have been anti-democracy currents, even if democracy inherently is much better placed to generate liberty and prosperity. But I think it also underscores that we need a framework for thinking about all of these issues. Now, of course, I am completely biased here, but this is exactly what the Narrow Corridor book that James Robinson and I wrote was intending. So we needed, we, we intended to provide a framework that is applicable across ages and across countries for thinking about what supports prosperity, what supports democracy, and what supports liberty. And the key idea of the narrow corridor is that we need robust political participation from the people, and we need the state to play a pro-liberty, pro-prosperity role in particular, for example, to create inclusive markets, which have the right legal system, the right equality of opportunity, the right regulations against the powerful actors, the right type of public good provision, as I emphasize in the context of education and healthcare. But how do you get robust political participation? How do you get the state to play that role, both in terms of achieving the right capacity and using that capacity in the right way? Some people may say, especially from the American audiences, oh, you need to have a better constitution. Well, Jim and I, you know, uh, don't attach much importance to that idea. We don't think uh, you build inclusive markets or democracy or liberty via well-designed constitutions. Instead, it is about a dynamic process between the state and society. And here is a summary of it, simplifying things quite a bit. We put society's power on the horizontal axis, the power of the state on the vertical axis. So high capacity states are on the vertical axis, well-organized societies that can solve the collective action problem via norms, traditions, uh, small group interactions, uh, civil society, parties, media are high up in the power of society. China would be here on the upper left quadrant state is strong, society is weak. And you see when that is the case, the dynamics are for further weakening of society, which is exactly what we are experiencing in China. You have many societies, in fact, the majority of human history has been under strong societies uh, in small scale societies, for example, and weak states. But in the middle here, you have our narrow corridor where power of the state and power of society are in balance, and you see something very different, qualitatively different. Now, what we call the shackled Leviathan can support freedom and prosperity, imperfectly albeit, but it's a dynamic process. And the arrows here are pointing upwards rather than to the left or down like this, which means that in this narrow corridor, you have a qualitatively different behavior. The potential cooperation, as well as the competition between state and society is creating a dialectic process where both state and society can become stronger over time. The state takes on more responsibilities, more regulation, new institutions, while society becomes more and more vigilant via new institutions, via better organization of democracy and so on. Remarkably, I would say, in contrast to the views that many political scientists have expressed, you don't get higher state capacity with despotic leviathans. This arrow here is going somewhere in the middle of the vertical axis, whereas this is growing here. And that's because the capacity of the state under cooperation with society is going to far exceed what you can achieve with just making people obey you by fiat, even with all of the brainwashing that China has uh, uh, invested in. Now, this framework provides a very different way of thinking about prosperity and freedom. You always have to fight for freedom. Freedom is never guaranteed because this corridor is narrow, so you can have shocks or changes that will take you out of it. But when things work, freedom and prosperity become self-reinforcing. 
It's a fragile state, but it is a self-reinforcing state. And it's something you cannot achieve by constitutions because you read the true mobilization of society against elites and against power. And that's why inequality is so corrosive. If you have very high inequality, you cannot have uh, limits to the power of elites. And this is what our framework emphasizes. And with the ancient Greeks, one of the early places where vibrant democracy was practiced, understood. So the Athenian Republic, for example, was a leader in introducing both new state institutions and new ways of controlling the state. Chief among them is quite emblematic of the forces that we emphasize. It's the uh, institution of ostracism, which Cleisthenes introduced. Every year, the uh, legislature would vote whether to have an ostracism. And if there is an ostracism, then all of the citizenry, the male citizens, unfortunately, women did not have the vote, male citizenry would vote who to ostracize. They would write the name of a person on a broken piece of shard, a shard of pottery called an ostracon. That's where the name ostracism comes from. And whosever name was written there would get ostracized. They would be exiled uh, from Athens for 10 years. So this is from the Themistocles' ostracism. Themistocles was as much of a hero as Athens has ever had. He saved Athens uh, against the Persians, and he identified the Spartan threat early on. He was a brilliant orator and brilliant soldier and a statesperson. But at some point, he got too big for his britches, and he was exiled via this ostracism process. Now, this all asks a very obvious question. What determines the shape, the boundaries, the uh, width of the narrow corridor. Where do capacity, high capacity states that can support liberty come from? In fact, this is asked in the language of the narrow corridor, which is our contribution. But this question in different forms have been asked by many social scientists. They have suggested the nature of technology, war or the threat of war. This is a very famous uh, thesis by Charles Tilley, the famous political sociologist, when he said states made war and war made the state. Uh, some kind of geographies are good for liberty or state's capacity, some crops or ownership structures or some cultures and so on and so forth. The problem is that when you look at history, you see as many places that support these theories as contradicted. So there are many places where the threat of war was associated with more state capacity and many places in which the threat of war led to the collapse of state capacity. And in fact, this is where this literature got itself into big tangles, but our framework makes it clear why. So what is greater state capacity? You can think of it in this graph as an increase in the power of the state, but you can immediately see what it will do. There was greater state capacity in Montenegro against external threats from the Ottomans and from other European powers that led to better monetary organization but it didn't do anything to Montenegro because they were so far from the corridor and the dynamics took Montenegro back towards weaker state after this. Prussia is the counterexample. Uh, as many people identified, including Voltaire, the state became subservient to the army. Why? Well, you can think of the Prussian uh, history as being in the narrow corridor. They had a very strong parliament. But against the threat of war, after, especially after the 30-year war, Prussia strengthened its institutions, strengthened the state, weakened the parliament, weakened the rights of citizens. And in, according to our theory, Prussia went out of the corridor. But Switzerland is a brilliant example where the cantons had to organize and build a stronger state. And that was conducive to even faster increases in state capacity together with liberty. This framework also highlights that if we want to build prosperity and uh, liberty around the world, there isn't a one size fit all remedy for it. If you are with a despotic Leviathan as, such as China, what you need is to increase the power of the state and perhaps weaken the power of the state. If you are is parts of sub-Saharan Africa where state capacity is very weak, what you need to do is strengthen state capacity. Or if you are in this region, as some of the examples we discuss in great detail in the book, which I'm not going to have the time to get into today, what you need is a simultaneous increase in both state capacity and power of society to get into the corridor. But I want to conclude by highlighting that all of this has to play out against a context that's defined by external events. 
we don't live in a world in which domestic political economy can be conceptualized without what's going on around the world. The coronavirus changed dynamics in many ways. Many countries increased surveillance during the coronavirus, and those tools have not been rolled back. So it is not a surprise that the authoritarian impulse has gotten stronger in places diverse, such as Mexico, Turkey, Hungary, and so on. And the Russian and Chinese anti-democracy movement, I think, has gained much faster momentum with the uh, uh, descent of the Russian regime into greater violence and greater kleptocracy, as witnessed by the uh, uh, international uh, crisis that has been triggered by the in invasion of Ukraine. I think uh, those highlight threats against democracy and by nature of the framework that I am describing here, threats against freedom and prosperity that we are going to have to live with in the decades to come. But in my mind, it doesn't change the key elements that I try to introduce in this short talk. For prosperity and liberty, we need democratic institutions. Democratic institutions need the support of the people. And for that, democratic institutions need to deliver not just in terms of growth, but in terms of public goods, low inequality, control of corruption. All of this is much easier if we have this balance between state and society, in particular, the kind of balance that only comes from the mobilization of society so that people can be vigilant against all kinds of elites, be they dictators like Vladimir Putin or economic elites such as you know Elon Musk or Sam Altman or other mega rich people. I think bottom-up participation against the powerful has to remain a key channel via which democracy, freedom, and prosperity have to be defended. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to address this very uh, exciting conference. And I'm again, sorry that I cannot be there with you in person. Thank you, bye-bye. So good. Good morning again. Uh, welcome to the panel on uh, Europe, Ukraine, and Russia. Um, we have very impressive panelists with us today. Let me start with Simeon Jenkov, who will talk to us about Europe. Uh, Simeon has been an advisor to our center for a long time. And um, he wrote in the Atlas the, the chapter on, on Europe, and also together with uh, Joseph Lemoine and myself, an overview of, uh, the, um, um, of the Atlas chapters. Uh, Simeon is a Bulgarian economist. Um, between 2009 and 2013, he was Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of Bulgaria. Uh, before that, he was um, actually, I think, the youngest um, chief economist uh, of um, what they call the vice presidency um, at the World Bank. Uh, it was the vice presidency for finance and the private sector. Uh, at the World Bank, he led several important projects, such as Women, Business, and the Law, the World Development Reports, and Doing Business. He was associate editor of the Journal of Comparative Economics, mm -hmm. and he is currently the, uh, the director of the Financial Markets Group at the London School of Economics. Uh, we have remotely um, Yuri Gorodnichenko, who was born in Ukraine, is an economist and uh, Quant Edge presidential professor at the University of California uh, at Berkeley. Um, he's also a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and is associated with several other prestigious research institutions. He's a, uh, a co-editor of the Journal of Monetary Economics. His work was published in leading economics journals around the world, and he received many awards for his teaching and research. And he has quite a remarkable recognition, uh, an organization called REPEC, which stands for Research Papers in Economics, ranks Korotnichenko as the top young economist in the world. Konstantin Sonin was born in Russia. He's also an economist in recognition for his outstanding research in the field of political economy. Uh, in December 2015, he was named the John Dewey Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. He's a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy 
of economic policy research SEPR in London and many other research institutions. He was um, the vice rector of the Higher School of Economics, a public research university in Moscow, but was forced to resign by the Putin authorities. He published in leading economic journals and um, he has the great distinction, actually I'm pretty jealous for this, he is uh, on the federal wanted list in Russia <laughs> um, and for uh, disclosing information um, on the Bucha massacre and the siege of Mariupol uh, that was in 2023 20, and that was not enough, so in 2024 an arrest warrant was issued for him in Russia. Um, and last but not least, Merinda Herring is um, an expert on Ukraine, but also on Eurasia matters in general. She is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Eurasia Center, uh, where she was a deputy director until recently. She's the author of several reports, including reforming the bureaucracy, the democracy bureaucracy. Um, and in 2017, she was a contributor to a volume entitled Does Democracy Matter, uh, which was published by Roman and Littlefield. So um, the first question will go to Simeon, who wrote the, the chapter on the European Union in our atlas. Um, Europe has been scoring above the global averages on both freedom and prosperity for the past 28 years, but um, Several indicators have stagnated since 2014. What's going on? Um, well, what's going on, Fred actually at uh, dinner last night summarized it, uh, Fred Kempe, I think, quite well, which is that there has been a recession in liberties globally. Um, Europe, of course, starts from a very high position, so we don't necessarily think of uh, Europe as a place that we should worry about uh, either democracy or um, liberal economics, but in a number of countries, as the report that we are launching today suggests, there actually has been a, a recession over the last uh, roughly um, decade. Um, it truly started with the Eurozone crisis, a financial crisis in 2008-2009, then a number of southern European countries got into trouble, um, um, Greece, our neighbor and from Bulgaria, Portugal, uh, Spain, uh, France to some extent, and so on. And then the population, as Daron was just talking about, started recalculating the values of, uh, of uh, liberties more generally, both democracy as well as uh, economic liberties. Uh, so that's how really it started, and that's why I'm not surprised that in your data done in the Atlas from 2014, you see first a leveling and then a decrease in... Um, in uh, some of the freedom uh, indicators. Uh, also this morning, Fred mentioned that uh, uh, many countries around the world, around two billion people, have uh, elections this year. I should note that all of Europe has uh, uh, an election coming uh, in about <laughs> three months. Uh, the election for the European Parliament, which uh, until very recently, most countries were not really counting as a real election because you have the national elections and then you send some people to, um, to uh, Brussels. Uh, done, but I think this uh, this year's the election uh, the elections are very important for two reasons. One, because of the overall European policy on Ukraine, mm. which is of course the assistance to Ukraine, but also how Europe itself gets organized on many issues like uh, um, uh, the military uh, structure of uh, the Union, which is essentially absent uh, mm. until uh, now. So, what do you do about this common? Um, foreign policy, which exists here and there, but again, is uh, not very strong. So what has uh, the war in Ukraine has galvanized uh, some uh, uh, movement towards common policies, but the next uh, uh, European Parliament and European Commission that will be selected based on this uh, Parliament has a lot to say about this. And I just want to finish with this thought, just as we worry about uh, the recession in uh, democracy in a number of um, large uh, uh, emerging market, so we worry about Europe, because in the last year, two years, but certainly from the last European elections, you have had um, 
shall we say, conservative governments, um, uh, right-wing governments in the Netherlands, in Italy, in a number of the very large important countries of the European Union. So I do worry whether 2024 would be another inflection point in, um, in the political as well as economic history of Europe. Thank you, Cindy. Well, I would like um, to ask Yuri the next question. <clears throat> Thank you, Yuri, for writing the chapter on Ukraine um, in our atlas. Our um, center did an interesting comparison between countries in Eastern Europe where some of them uh, chose to join the European Union and chose economic, political, legal freedom and countries that did not. Ukraine did not. And the numbers for Ukraine, looking historically, these 28 years uh, that we are covering in our uh, historical da data, show a complex mm -hmm. uh, picture for Ukraine. Would you care to elaborate on that, please? Thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting me to join this very exciting project and this conference. And I'm sorry for not being able to join this in person. Mm -hmm. Um, Ukraine has a very long, very complicated history, and maybe not surprisingly, it also has a very volatile uh, trajectory. Uh, just you know, to set the perspective here, you know, think about what was happening on the Ukrainian side. In 1991, Ukraine got uh, or regained its independence, and it was a dream for many, many uh, generations of Ukrainians. But at the same time, you have to fight the Soviet legacy and the mentality of fears of influence, not just in Ukraine, but everywhere else. And so when you look at Ukraine, you see lots and lots of people in the early 90s who never traveled to Europe. They didn't know how life would be. All they saw was, you know, the Soviet repression, the misery and so on. And so many people just didn't have any idea how life can look for them if they join Europe. So there was less demand uh, to move in that direction. Also remember at that time in the 90s and even after that, there was a very strong influence of communist ideas, basically ranging from, uh, you know, red directors running the country. For example, former president Leonid Kuchma was one of these red directors to basic popular expectations that all social services have to be provided for free to everybody. That's obviously not sustainable. And to overcome this legacy, this baggage, uh, to reestablish European aspirations. Ukraine had to have basically two revolutions, the Orange Revolution in 2004, and then another revolution in 2013, 2014, the Revolution of Dignity. This last revolution was, you know, a, a, point, a tipping point. You know, after this, Ukraine did many reforms, and the movement towards the European Union became irreversible. But this is sort of on the Ukrainian side. We have a lot of action there since 2013. You look at the European side and you very quickly realize that very few people understood Ukraine back then in the 90s and even as recently as you know, early 2000s. So basically, you know, frankly, you ask people in the West to put Ukraine on the map before the full-scale Russian invasion and they would struggle. Now it's obvious that you know, Ukraine is there and it's a different country, but it wasn't like that for many years. In fact, you know, many experts were really uh, on Ukraine were really experts on, on Russia rather than Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at, you know, policymakers, you look at the experts, you look at the general public, they all believe that Ukraine is a part of the Russian sphere of influence. And again, just as a reminder, you know, how strong that is, we go to 1991 when President Bush was in Kiev and he delivered a speech which was called a uh, Chicken Kiev speech. Uh, uh, this was just a few weeks before Ukraine declared independence, and he was basically saying that Ukraine should not do this. It's suicidal nationalism. And we have this, you know, situation for many, many years when Ukraine became a sort of a no man's land, when people didn't care enough in the West about Ukraine because that's so it's a part of Russia. And so as a result, uh, Ukraine was um, sort of an object that was easy to sacrifice to build or reload relations with Russia. That was an unfortunate situation. And so as a result, you have this dynamic equilibrium, if you will, in no man's land, where you know, Ukraine is not ready, Europe is not ready, and Ukraine didn't have internal capacity after 1991 to uh, make you know, a sustained effort to join the European Union. And also Europe didn't have enough uh, interest in Ukraine. And so Ukraine didn't have an external institutional anchor to make this move 
unlike some other countries in the region, like Poland, Hungary, and so on. And um, so that's a difficult situation, but you know, it's very clear now that Ukraine is a democratic country. We had six presidents since 1991, and it's very clear this is the beating heart of democracy in Europe. So I'm hopeful that despite all this very complicated years since 1991, Ukraine and Europe will be in a union uh, in the future. Thank you very much, Yuri. Um, Konstantin, the next question is for you. One of the things that we like to do, one of the most useful things that we do with our indexes is to, to show graphs and to plot the data over periods of time and to compare the trends between countries or between countries and regions or between regions. And one of the striking things about Russia is how it has not closed the gap mm -hmm. with the European Union yeah. in either freedom or in prosperity. And recently, actually, we see a dip in both of them. Would you like to comment, please? And by the way, thank you for writing the, the, the Russia section in our atlas. I've found it very illuminating. Um, thank you. I, I think the great thing that your index, indices show is the gradual deterioration of, of both political and economic freedoms. Because if you follow news coverage on Russia, then it's typically either Russia, Russia is totally a market economy, it's a hot place, everything is going well, Russia is winning, then it switches to Russia is collapsing, it is a catastrophe, Putin will be gone in a year. But the indices show that the uh, economic freedoms, a lot of achievements of 90s, they were gradually deteriorating over the Putin's rule. Since the, his first days in power, Putin was building an authoritarian state. And for some years, it sort of worked because, for example, they got rid of the common criminals. Mm -hmm. They uh, were getting rid of the criminals uh, who were s serving in the police force. So there was a period when it was good for growth. But then it was obvious that it would not because a personalistic dictatorship, it's not something that could, uh, that could ensure economic freedoms. So in the next 15 years, we've seen stealth nationalization it was not very noticeable it does not it didn't always make headlines but russia nationalized more enterprises i think peacefully than any other country ever certainly like the uh, most by the market value and this this thing is continued and with time passing as the indices shows this was this has become a huge impediment for development because it appeared that Putin friends who have pointed to all the important positions, they are no better for business than the common criminals of 90s. They're as greedy, they're as predatory. So eventually it deteriorated to the state when they made decision to invade Ukraine, which I think stopped most of, most of the prospects of business development. Nowadays, they simply nationalize enterprises just Yesterday, we had news about another arrest, another nationalization of a big enterprise that was, it was privatized in early 90s. It was just a metallurgy combinat. These are people who just made it work when everything was collapsing. Now, 30 years after that, they arrested, they will have to transfer their shares to the, um, I don't know, police state. Thank you. So, Melinda, one of the things that you did at the uh, Eurasia Center when, uh, when, you, when you were here was to look at the interplay between the different countries in, in the region. One of the consequences of the 22 reinvasion of Ukraine has been that a lot of um, migrant workers that would, would go into Russia from the Central Asian republics mm -hmm. Uh, decided not to go there. What are the consequences in those regions from this development? Thanks, Dan. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Thank you to you and Joseph and Fred for the chance to be here. Uh, so 
I have to say one thing before I, I jump into Central Asia. Uh, I have been banned by Russia twice, but I now have a new life goal of, of getting on the warrant list like Constantine. So yeah. thank you for I, in, you inspiring how, how me. How yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll compare notes on this. Okay. So uh, Central Asian migration is, is really interesting because uh, several of the economies are very reliant on Russia. And they're reliant on the construction sector and also uh, in agriculture. So uh, I've been, Dan, looking at sort of the knock-on effects. We, we know how the war has affected Ukraine and Russia and the EU, and we can speak about that. But what does it mean in places that don't get as much attention, like Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan? So before the war, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan received more than 30 percent of their GDP in labor remittances. So this was people uh, from Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan who had gone to Russia doing low-level jobs that other Russian citizens didn't want to do. So in 22, the World Bank made some predictions, and they thought that remittances would massively drop because of the war. But they found the opposite, actually. They found that remittances in 22 reached record highs due to increased demand for labor and the Russian ruble's appreciation relative to the U.S. dollar. Analysts were speculating that these Central Asian migrants would also relocate to South Korea, the UK, and Kazakhstan, but they haven't. So that's sort of the, the surprise that I found. Uh, there's a lot of complicated dynamics. There's also a lot of Russians who've moved to Kazakhstan in particular, uh, and also to Uzbekistan to try to get away from the draft. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, so Simeon, <clears throat> one of the observations regarding trends in Europe um, is that while the freedoms um, of, um, of Europe seem to be secure, I mean, there are elections everywhere, and governments come and go as things should be, but there are serious challenges to the prosperity outlook for Europe. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on that, please? There are serious uh, challenges to the, to the, to the outlook, um, partly because um, um, of a demographic issue, so mm. Europe more so than any other continent or uh, set of uh, set of um, uh, countries is uh, is aging, um, and various attempts to address this issue either through technology, as Daron was uh, mentioning, or through some sort of uh, meaningful policy on um, on uh, migration has not not developed well. Has met uh, has met a lot of uh, uh, of uh, resistance. So the conversation has been going on for some time. What are the productivity le levers? How can Europe become more productive with fewer, um, with, uh, fewer people? Better technology, there was a lot of hope on uh, so-called green technology so that addressing climate change, Europe somehow will heavily invest in um, uh, greener and better technology. Incidentally, the war in Ukraine has completely stopped this and I would mm -hmm. say reversed this uh, conversation as countries that were previously saying before the war, this is our path, now are saying we first need to sort out assistance to Ukraine and how our own security, we're discussing security in Ukraine, we should also discuss security in Europe, which uh, costs a lot. Europe has uh, historically depended a lot on the United States mm -hmm. for its uh, security for decades, not uh, just recently. And now it's uh, coming up to the fore that uh, a significant increase in, um, uh, in essentially defense budgets has to happen, not just for helping Ukraine, but for helping Europe uh, uh, itself. And that is facing the reality I thought we were talking about productivity, but now we actually need these uh, other tasks to deal with uh, first, which is why I would say the prosperity topic has taken uh, again a back, uh, a back seat. Europe, incidentally, as a structure of the institutions, is not very good at multitasking. So at most, you can focus on one topic, um, uh, just the structure of Brussels, the structure between national and uh, regional um, uh, institutions as such, but you cannot really do the war in Ukraine and uh, prosperity. So now I think, I, to summarize it briefly, the future prosperity in Europe depends on how successful we are in Ukraine. If we are successful in Ukraine, prosperity would come as a topic, and I think we'll have a more elevated view on it, but not now. Interesting. Thank you. 
So, Yuri, next question to you. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, we've done some work um, in our center on the effect of joining the European Union has on the prosperity of countries. So, uh, the United Kingdom can afford to Brexit uh, because they have a lot of institutions <coughs> that function well. But what we found was that um, in the former communist countries, the effect of joining uh, and even of being a candidate member of the European Union has had a very beneficial effect in improving the institutions. Can you tell me what we should expect in Ukraine now that Ukraine is a candidate to the European Union? Yes, thank you. We should expect lots and lots of positive things uh, from even candidacy status, not, not just you know joining the European Union. Uh, even this pro prospect of joining the European Union can open access to technologies, capital, uh, markets. It's also going to give an institutional anchor. We see this happen in Poland, in Hungary, in many other countries. Um, so Ukraine will undergo a massive wave of modernization, and that's going to be very helpful for the country. Uh, but to be clear, this is a two-way street. It's really a win-win situation for everybody. Western Europe jo uh, benefited a lot from uh, Eastern Europe, Bulgaria, Poland, Romania, and so on, uh, joining the Union. Uh, Ukraine will be an equally important um, success story for the European Union because Ukraine has so much uh, to offer. Uh, like think about lots and lots of sense, food security, uh, zero carbon energy, many other things. For example, you know, Europe has struggled to develop its own IT cluster uh, that can rival you know, China or Silicon Valley here in the US. And uh, Ukraine has a very dynamic IT cluster, you know, a very, very good one. And uh, so it doesn't have to be a wild west, if you will, to develop this IT uh, cluster. It can be wild east. You know, Ukraine can be the Silicon Valley because, for example, many people don't know but number one export from Ukraine to the United States is not food, it's not steel, it's IT services. Mm -hmm. And so this can be a role for Ukraine in the future European Union. Um, one thing I would like to add is that this union is not going to be complete <clears throat> until Ukraine joins NATO, because NATO can offer security and uh, a guarantee that Russia is not going to invade Ukraine anytime soon. If this guarantee is not there, Ukraine is not going to be an investable country. People and capital will leave the country because they will always have to live in the shadow of Russian aggression. And that's why NATO membership is so critical uh, for Ukraine and for, for the European Union. Because again, this is really a win-win situation. Ukraine can offer so much to European security. Uh, clearly, European countries are not ready to handle Russia at this stage, but Ukraine is and we should use this opportunity. Thank you, Yuri. Um, Constantine, in your um, chapter um, in the Atlas, you talk about how um, a number of tensions and the problems that existed in Putin's Russia have been exacerbated by the invasion of Ukraine. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, okay, I, I do not know what is going to happen uh, on the battlefield, although I think that Ukraine, uh, Ukraine will prevail. But certainly, as a model of economic development, as a model of building prosperity, Putin's model has already, already failed and failed spectacularly. So there is like no doubt that there will be a huge disruption after the war ended and the Putin regime a regime collapses. So basically what Putin built now uh, is based on a huge militarization of every decision making. Military decides what is what is being done in the business. Security services see, have their people in every, every business. Everything is subordinated to this war. Also domestically the regime uh, operates at the level of repression. Tens of thousands of Russians were arrested in anti-war protests, thousands are in jail. And the thing is that Putin has no means to de-escalate this. Like mm -hmm. up until the end, they will keep arresting people, mm -hmm. uh, they will keep uh, killing people. So I think like now people, um, some people say that Putin is strong because he can bomb Ukrainians, because he commands huge armies, because he could kill 
people in jail and put them in jail as he killed uh, my friend Alexei, as I'm sure uh, Alexei Navalny was killed uh, on his orders um, a week ago. But Putin is also weak because he's, uh, he's sort of cornered. He's, he cannot, he cannot de-escalate and the country cannot live in a state of this like total militarization and hyster hysteria. So I think uh, it's, there will be a new Russia, there will be a new transition. We will have round tables about this future <laughs> economic reforms <laughs> and how to help Russia out of this, but it's in the future. Thank you, Konstantin. So Melinda, you told me that one of the things you've been researching recently has been the impact on the human capital mm -hmm. in Ukraine of both the COVID crisis mm -hmm. and the war. So please share this with us. Great. So, Yuri, I want to congratulate you on your chapter. I thought it was really excellent. And the statistic that jumped out at me uh, the most was that you found that Ukrainian children may make 20 percent less as a result of the war. And I think that's a horrifying statistic. Uh, and I, I, I started to think about it a bit more. And I think there's more pieces, too, uh, that are worth discussing. So I think you're 100 percent right that this is a big problem. But also access to in-person education depends very heavily on on where you are in Ukraine right now. So if you're in the West, you're probably in person and taking lessons with a teacher. But if you're very close to the front line, you, you don't have uh, in-person classes. You're probably at home. Uh, and your overhaul, your overhaul likelihood of prosperity is going to go down. Uh, I went to Zaporizhia, at, which is on the front line, uh, in October. And all schools, Dan, in that oblast are closed. They don't have bomb shelters. So that, that's a, a big issue is access could I, to education. Could I in intervene and say that you could donate to Kiev School of Economics Foundations that builds bomb shelters to schools so that they can operate? You absolutely can. So I went to Kiev School of Economics, and Timothy Milovanov is going to thank us for, for this intervention. Yeah, they build it like $5,000, and there is a new bomb shelter, and the school can operate daily for, for but kids. But this is the new reality that Ukrainians are living in. So Kiev School of Economics is one of the best institutions to do a real economic education. It, it, it's like... It's like London School of Economics, but in Kiev. Uh, and they've created eight bomb shelters underground. So during bomb raids, uh, bachelor students and master's students, PhD students can take their classes with wonderful, distinguished professors like yeah. these guys. I, I, taught, I taught a class in the bomb shelter last <laughs> March. There you go. Uh, Kostya is going, sorry, in for two months teaching next month there. So good luck, Kostya. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. But overall, the, the picture of Ukraine's economy is changing. So after 22, we expected a big drop, and it dropped 29%. Uh, last year, though, it grew about 5%. And the reason why is the harvest was better than they expected. There was a lot of government spending. And there was improved electricity. And I think that's sort of an interesting mm. finding. People can get online. And they can, they can participate in the workforce because they have that Internet access. And I, I, as Yuri highlighted, this is an economy where there's a lot of really smart people. And there's a lot of high tech talent. But I think there's, uh, Yuri, there's two other things that I would encourage you maybe next year to include. Uh, that I'm worried about beyond educational access and those, those long-term perspectives for the Ukrainian labor market. I'm worried about landmines. We know that landmines really retard economic development. Ukraine is the most heavily mined country in the world today, worse than Afghanistan and Iraq. It covers, mines cover one-third of the territory. Globsec in Slovakia says that it will take 757 years to clear the land through traditional methods. Ukraine is really smart, though, and they're using AI. And Ukrainian farmers are building homemade uh, tractors to, to remove the, these mines. The other worry that I have, Yuri, is demography. And I know this is on your mind, too. Before the war, Ukraine didn't have enough people. They weren't even at replacement levels. And after the war, at least 6 million people have moved abroad. And when you talk to people, they tell you objection one, two, and three to returning is security. Thank you. Um, well, you know, there was this, this, um, this line from uh, Monty Python that says, and now for something totally different. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to let this opportunity pass by uh, without uh, getting uh, to share with the audience here and the audience virtually 
um, Simeon's insights because you've been involved with our indexes for such a long time on one of the, the, the most important issues having to do with our results, which is it's very clear that the correlation between freedom and prosperity is very high. But the question is still always there on the direction of causality. Mm -hmm. Is it going from freedom to prosperity, or is it going from prosperity to freedom? And you wrote in the overview to the Atlas some comments on that, but it's nothing like hearing it from the professor talking himself. So the floor is yours. No, thank you. And actually, Daron touched upon this, mm -hmm. uh, this topic with his figures, where he was showing over time how some countries that start uh, authoritarian and then turn democratic, so after the difference, what happens? So in this uh, book that uh, is, I think, online already, so everybody can uh, access it, we have uh, at the beginning um, um, a figure, figure three to be exact, which basically does what Daron was showing us, but globally, uh, which is to show when uh, liberties change or, or when you become freer or actually less free, so in either direction, what happens to prosperity. So economists call this difference in differences. So you're not looking at the trend over time. You're looking at when a country changes or countries change, what happens to their prosperity and also over time. And we find a very strong correlation between if uh, we see changes in, um, in freedoms with some delay, we also uh, see uh, improvements uh, in um, or changes, I should say, in prosperity, because it goes in both directions, Then, So we've been talking about uh, recession in freedoms. Uh, there are some countries that improve, and we applaud that. But there are a number of countries. We're talking about Russia, but Venezuela, mm -hmm. which are a number of countries in the world, uh, Pakistan, have uh, we have seen uh, significant deterioration in freedoms, and then as a result, uh, in prosperity. But using this difference in difference, uh, methodology, uh, I think, is what uh, gives us, uh, gives us um, some, uh, some uh, solace, some hope that our uh, analysis really flows from changes in freedoms to uh, changes in uh, prosperity. When you try the opposite of saying, well, maybe, maybe uh, you first change prosperity, and certainly in economics, in political science, there are such theories that you first need to reach a certain level of prosperity to kind of have the luxury of thinking about uh, freedoms. So if you reverse the difference and say, does change in prosperity change freedoms? And the answer there is no, uh, or it's at least not, uh, not statistically significant. So that methodology that we do use in the Atlas, and which actually Daron and his colleagues have used very successfully, is gives us some, um, some hope, actually, for, uh, for the world or for the topics that we're discussing now and some security in, the, in our findings. Great, thank you. Um, so we have six more minutes in, um, in this panel. One of the things that uh, fascinate me, I would love to ask Konstantin this question. Uh, a very large number of talented people have mm. fled Russia mm. um, after the invasion of uh, Ukraine. There were people leaving Russia before mm -hmm. also. Uh, but the war has accentuated this trend. And I think clearly long term, the effect is severe, but I would think even short term. So could you comment no, on that? I, I think there is a hu huge effect. The thing is that since the beginning of the war, there are different estimates, but about a million mm -hmm. Russians uh, left Russia, became uh, refugees uh, in other countries. And Russian cities are not being bombed. Russian, Russian, uh, there are no tanks on the Russian soil. So it's not like uh, refugees from Ukraine. These are people who are running from peaceful countries. Perhaps hundreds of thousands, maybe 200 of thousands, are people who are just running from the draft. But others, for example, my peers, no, they're not going to be drafted. But people do not want to be associated with this. And in the science, in uh, education, it's like a totally devastating. So like mm -hmm. uh, in my profession in economics, I think more than half of people who ever published in international journals lived in within these two, mm -hmm. two years, and we do not know how much of the, those who stay are living. The same thing in physics, in mathematics. I 
um, when I was living in Moscow, I worked part-time in a high school for many years. Uh, thousands of teachers left Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. people who were trying to help in Europe, there are new, like four new schools in one city in Montenegro, four new Russian schools. Mm -hmm. There are new Russian schools in Berlin, in mm -hmm. Cyprus, and because there is so much talent living, and these mm -hmm. people will not come back. So this is actually, it's worse than 1990 and 1991. So the Russian science was larger then, but it's more people proportionally and in absolute numbers who left because of the, of the war. Thank you, Konstantin. So, Yuri, in the last three minutes here, the, the, the question on, on Ukraine, obviously all freedom-loving people are wish the best for Ukraine in this, in this struggle. Unfortunately, the war may drag on, and one of the consequences of that is that people who have left may not return because they make a life in a different country. They make a life in, in Germany, they make a life in, in Poland. Or I'm sure you've thought about this. What would you say about the, the risk that as the war drags on, the effect on patriotic Ukrainians may be that it will be more difficult to return? It is a very difficult question, but as Melinda said, you know, the number one, number two, and number three concern about a factor that determines this choice, you know, to return or not to return is security. If you have peace in Ukraine, if you have security, people will return. And as many as 80% of people, refugees in European and other countries, say that when the conditions are right, they will return to Ukraine. Mm. Uh, but for this to happen, as I said, you have to have security, you have to have some other conditions. For example, you have to have housing. You know, people have to have a home to return to. And this is a big concern because 8% of housing stock in Ukraine is destroyed. It's, it's millions and millions and millions of people are, who are affected by this. And so we have to not only reach peace, but we also have to have conditions for those people to return. They have to have a job, they have to have a home. And this is where Ukraine is going to need its allies, its friends, uh, to, to recover from this you know, very uh, unspeakable tragedy. Well, this panel is not only brilliant in its intellect, but also on time. <laughs> so uh, we are precisely one minute before. Time for me to thank you all. Thank you very much, Konstantin, Simeon, Melinda, and thank you very much, uh, Yuri. And this concludes the panel that we had right now. Thank you so much, all. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Joseph Lemoyne. I'm the director of the Freedom and Prosperity Center. Uh, this is a research conference. I don't know if you guys heard, but we just uh, launched a book. Um, so if we can pull the slides. Uh, it's currently available on the Atlantic Council uh, main page. Uh, for those online, you can go on the, on the event, uh, event page as well, and it should be linked uh, in there. Um, it's, uh, like we said, it's a, it's a world tour. Uh, it covers 18 countries and region. We invited many great experts that are a lot of them are here today. Uh, and Darren Akshimoglu wrote the foreword. Uh, this, this is the list of chapters. Uh, this is to encourage you to go look at it. It's a very prestigious um, uh, group of people, uh, and uh, we're very excited about it. And it's, uh, it's also beautiful, um, something very important. And the work that we're doing is to make this research that sometimes can sound heavy accessible. We want people to go look at it go explore, uh, go learn things. So we really designed something that we hope you will find uh, enjoyable to, to read, to play around, and so on. And um, like we said, the, this book, each author uh, uh, comments on the Freedom and Prosperity Indexes as the entry point of each chapter, and then reflect on their experience from their own knowledge uh, of their country or their region. So the Freedom and Prosperity Indexes is an annual publication by the Atlantic Council. Um, we 
are going to update the data uh, in um, uh, early May. Uh, here you can see the first two uh, reports, annual reports. And I want to stress out that we have a great website available that also falls into the, this idea of making data accessible. Um, you can access all the data that we have for 164 countries, uh, 28 years of, of data and, and growing. And you can pick every single component, indicators, measurements that you are interested in to see how it compares with regional, uh, regional, regional average, other countries, and you can explore trends and so on. Uh, we say indexes plural because we have two separate indexes, freedom on one hand and prosperity. And that's, we do that to be able to actually study this relationship, which is at the essence and the core of, of what we do in the center is, is freedom actually the best path to prosperity? And like, we, like it was discussed earlier, the research find, finds that it is. If you're a country today and you are going to improve your freedom, at term, you will see the benefits in terms of prosperity. Um, on the Freedom Index, we measure three things, um, political freedom, economic freedom, and legal freedom, or the, the rule of law. And on prosperity, we have a beyond GDP definition of prosperity, so we not only look at income, uh, GDP per capita, but also health, inequality, education, minority rights, and the environment. And here's the list of everything that we measure. Uh, this is to trigger your curiosity. Uh, if you want to go look at um, political rights in Myanmar in the past 30 years, you can do that on our website. Uh, so we really encourage you to go explore. And the entire data set is available uh, for download for free, of course, uh, on, on our website. And we are a research conference. Um, for those in person, uh, next door, we're going to go into coffee break now and, and during this break and during the lunch break. In the room next door, you would see some of the research that has been done uh, with our partners and by the center. Uh, we encourage you to interact with those scholars. For those online, uh, you can, uh, uh, on the event page, everything is listed there with links to the, to the, to the, to the publication. Uh, this, this one uh, has been mentioned already. The, um, Patrick Kirk from the, the International Republican Institute and Lauren Van Meter from the uh, National Democratic Institute use the indexes to explore how China and Russia perform uh, in terms of uh, freedom and prosperity. And the title of the publication lets you guess what the results, uh, results are. Um, uh, Jérémy Bertrand from the uh, ESEG School of Management and Caroline Perrin from the World Bank with the, with the team here look at, uh, use the Freedom Index to explore what uh, drives foreign direct investment. Looking at uh, today uh, in the context of decoupling with China and Frenchering and so on, what are the, the things that are attracting investments and what, what do those countries that have more investments have in common? As you see here, no matter if you look at, look at it in terms of G FDI per capita or FDI in percentage of GDP, free countries across all region attract much more uh, investment. But we, we were also able to test all things equal, what is driving this relationship, and we find that <clears throat> um, security, you know, not a surprise, property rights and corruption are the three main drivers today to uh, foreign direct investment. Um, our friend for the Mexico uh, Council of For Foreign Affairs, COMEXI, uh, did um, uh, a public publication using the methodology from the Prosperity Index to measure uh, at the st Mexican state level the, perfor the performance of, ch of each of the, the states. And here as well, the very inter interesting findings you, you see with this color map that there are disparities in terms, you know, between countries in terms of prosperity, but within states, there's also a lot of uh, 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 disparities and different levels of prosperity. And here, a great tool for, um, for, uh, for, for policies uh, in Mexico to understand actually how is the government uh, delivering for their people. Um, this, we launched a new book, Six months ago, we launched our first book, uh, which is a collection of essays by 30 scholars from all over the world. Um, the book is available next door. For those online, you can download it on the, on the, on, on the events page. 
uh, there's a lot of great chapters there. It's, it falls again in our objective of inviting scholars and experts from those countries to get their, you know, the real life knowledge of, of, of where they're from and what they're, or where they worked on. Um, some great chapters, uh, violence against journalists in Mexico, uh, one of the most successful chapter in this book, uh, very interesting, the role of elites. Uh, in Kenya, uh, government inter intervention in Nigeria. So here again, I'm saying this to trigger your curiosity and for you to go uh, to go explore. Um, a lot of the publications are still in the working draft. Uh, so for those online, I'm sorry, you, they're not ready. But for those that are here, please engage with our scholars that are here in person. Um, Ambassador Kelly Curry is writing a case study um, on Myanmar. Um, Adrian Basavan is writing a case study on, on, the, on China's national innovation system looking at uh, artificial intelligence, so, you know, big topic. And uh, Julio is um, looking at what drives innovation and how bureaucracy uh, in affects uh, uh, innovation. And Ignacio uh, is looking at the empirical investigation of the effect of freedom on economic growth. So, Please join us for coffee, a little snacks next door. Uh, we hope you engage and learn things today. And uh, thank you. And, and for those online, we'll be back in about 20 minutes. Thank you.
Good morning. I'm Kimberly Reed, and I'm so honored to be here with this outstanding research conference to discuss the topic of the freedom-based development model in the Indo-Pacific region. I have been thrilled to be a part of the Atlantic Council Freedom and Prosperity Center as a distinguished fellow, and I'd like to thank the staff and uh, Dan Negrea and Michael Fish and, of course, uh, Fred Kempe for uh, their wonderful commitment to things that I hold very dear to me and I've worked on for my entire career. We know that the freedom-based development model, we need to be focused, as we've heard today, on freedom and prosperity beyond just development. And the keys to freedom and prosperity are free markets, rule of law, free press, and democracy. I'll say that Dan and his colleague Matthew Kronig have just published a new book called We Win and They Lose. And I'd like to read a small excerpt from that. As Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, the American people have an inalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Or translated in today's language, they have a right to security, freedom, and prosperity. We find the same concepts in the preamble to the Constitution, which says the purpose of US government is to, quote, provide for the common defense, or security, promote for the general welfare, or prosperity, and secure the blessings of liberty, or as we know today, freedom. These values articulated in America's founding documents mirror three primary goals of US foreign policy is spelled out in our countless national security strategies over the years. The security of freedom, security of, and prosperity of the American people. I rose, most recently concluded a tenure as uh, chairman of the Export-Import Bank of the United States, where I had the honor to see prosperity working around the world and also seeing where prosperity could work around the world. I witnessed some amazing conversations. I witnessed some amazing business transactions. And I witnessed amazing hope in our country for the world. I was so pleased. And I wear the color purple today, not because I'm an advocate of Alzheimer's and have been on their board for many years, but because I last wore this dress on October 27, 2020 when I was in Burma meeting with State Councilor Aung San Suu Kyi, who was my, uh, Burma's de facto leader. We know uh, now that uh, she's under house arrest. But when I had a conversation with her in 2020, it was focused on what we're going to talk about today, freedom and uh, prosperity. I'm also wearing a pin, and it's a bird. And I presented this pin to the Sudanese Minister of Finance in early January 2021, Her Excellency Dr. Hiba Ahmed Ali. It's a replica of the United States First First Lady Martha Washington's Pearl Dove pin. And when I presented this to her in early 2021, I said that it was a declaration of Mrs. Washington's hope for the future, for peace and for prosperity, for the new United States of America. And I wish the same for Sudan. Unfortunately, we've had a coup in Sudan, and we've seen travesty there as well. But this conference will highlight what are the keys to freedom and prosperity. And I'm so pleased to have three experts with us. We're going to be hearing from Ambassador Kelly Curry, who is the former United States Representative, UN Economic and Social Council, and former Alternative Representative to the UN General Assembly. We're going to be hearing from Johanna Cow, Senior Director for Asia Pacific at the International Republican Institute, and from Dr. Kotaro Shiojiri, who is the Japan Visiting Fellow at the Wilson Center. When I ask you your first question, I'd love for you to touch also on your own backgrounds, but very, very impressive. And as we go into our discussion today on the freedom-based development model in the, in the Pacific, I'd just like to point out, if you've not looked at at home or in our audience, the 2023 Prosperity and Freedom Index. And as we look at the Indo-Pacific region, we know that the region is one of the most dynamic and fastest growing regions on Earth. It's an essential driver for security and prosperity. It's home to more than half the world's population and accounts for 60% of, of global GDP as well as two-thirds of global economic growth. 
when we're looking at the United States, trade between the US and the Indo-Pacific region reached over $2 trillion in 2022. And the United States benefits from more than $956 billion in foreign direct investment in the Indo-Pacific. And that's important because we believe that prosperity is what everyone wants in our world. So um, in addition to meeting with Aung San Suu Kyi and um, spending time in the region, I was really honored in 2019 when I was the head of Export Import Bank to attend with uh, Ambassador and National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, the 2019 East Asia Summit. And I was just in awe as I sat in a room with the leaders of the countries of the Indo-Pacific region and learned a lot about what was happening at that time. And what we've seen from then until today is looking at the index. And again, the index ranks uh, countries from the scale of ranking of number one country to 164. Japan in 2023, when it comes to freedom, ranked 23rd and prosperity 22 out of all the countries listed. Taiwan, 27 for freedom, 26 for prosperity. South Korea, freedom, 34, prosperity, 13. Indonesia, freedom, 80, prosperity, 98. And again, out of 164 countries globally. <clears throat> the Philippines, freedom, 102, prosperity, 80. The People's Republic of China, freedom, 144, prosperity, 119. And finally, Burma, freedom 158 and prosperity 151. So how do we get at this? And I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Shiojiri. Can you tell us about Japan's initiative regarding free and open Indo-Pacific efforts and its influence in the region? Thank you very much. Uh, it's an uh, honor and pl privilege to be here. And thank you very much for having me uh, here at Atlantic Council. Uh, let me talk uh, first about the free and open Pacific, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, uh, vision, uh, which is co so-called FOIP uh, that Japan is presenting, and uh, some of the challenges actually it is facing. Uh, and my background is uh, was an official of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan uh, for about ten years, and I had an early retirement. Uh, so I'm free uh, from the government, and I'm, uh, this is my individual view, and I will be critical to Japan as well. So please uh, bear that in mind as well. Uh, but. Uh, uh, moving back to the FOIP uh, idea, uh, what is it about? Uh, and I will be very succinct and, and will uh, refer to the March 2023 uh, speech by Prime Minister Kishida in New Delhi in India uh, that he did. And also we refer to the 2023 revised uh, development cooperation cha charter that uh, Prime Minister Kishida also revised. Uh, I'll be very uh, clear about the core concept of the FOIP, uh, which is, and I quote, uh, to lead the international community in the direction of cooperation rather than division and confrontation, which sort of resonates with the domestic politics as well, but we are focusing on international community and international politics. And some of the uh, goals include enhancing the connectivity of the Indo-Pacific region, fostering the region into a place that value freedom, the rule of law, free from force and coercion, which resonates to what you mentioned earlier, and also make the region prosperous. So these are the core concepts. And uh, quickly moving forward, uh, let me focus on the challenges that uh, some of the FOIP ideas are having, uh, which I think is important in terms of how to build partnership in the region, how to uh, move forward with this idea, uh, which is very important, I think, in order to implement the idea. So my question is, how do you gain support from the countries in the region uh, when you have these uh, concepts? And I think there are three folds uh, to that answer. And number one is the power of concept, vision itself. Number two is the attitude or approach. And number three is the quantity or the tangible uh, benefit that they will get uh, from this concept or vision. So number one concept and vision, the power of it, uh, which is uh, sort of uh, very clear uh, from the outset. But I think the defending freedom, the rule of law, is very important when you're facing some concerns of attempts to change the status quo. Uh, by force or a coercion is something that uh, the region, uh, the countries are being worried about. So how to help uh, them address that, uh, including Japan, uh, is, is one of the th core concepts. And also respect, respect for diversity, 
inclusiveness and openness is also something that it needs to be addressed, uh, which is the FOIP uh, is one of the efforts to address that as well. Number two is the attitude and approach, which I think uh, is very important and maybe slightly different from the US approach. Japan approach is to sort of, uh, through dialogue and collaboration and as equal partners, uh, two ways that relationship needs to be uh, driven and also uh, the focus on people needs to be done, as you mentioned, uh, in terms of uh, the importance to focus on people. And quickly move forward to number three is the quantity or the tangible methods, uh, which I believe is important. And to that, uh, Japan is proposing to mobilize a total of more than 75 billion US dollars in the public and private uh, funds by the year 2030, uh, which is probably not enough. And that's why I think Japan needs to partner with other countries, of course, and that the, the power of the co coalition or partnership uh, matters. So let me stop here uh, by laying out some of the core concepts of FOIP and also challenges, uh, but saying that it's easy to say, uh, difficult to do, and it's a very daunting task. Thank you. Th thank you very much. <coughs> Johanna, can we discuss the China chapter <laughs> in two general area, the areas? Talk about the broader uh, prosperity opportunity and whether it's happened or not and the clear commitment by the Chinese Communist Party to inequality. Sure, um, I'm happy to. So um, just, just by way of, of a, a slightly extended introduction, I, I, the organization I work for, International Republican Institute, that we, we work on democratic assistance. Uh, I'm, I oversee our Asia Pacific region. Um, and so you know, covering the, the scope of, of the, the region we're gonna be talking about today, uh, 23 country programs, and I have had the, the honor of being able to sort of live and work in that region for most of my life, um, moving to DC a few years ago. Um, this China chapter, working on this China chapter, it was a really unique opportunity to take a step back um, and look at the data um, with sort of overlaying it with my own direct experience, sort of working with partners both inside China and outside. So I appreciate from the Atlantic Council the opportunity to do that. Um, and I want to get at your question by first sort of getting into a little bit of the context on what the, the indices were really showing in terms of, of, of kind of freedom first before we get into the prosperity. Because, you know, I, I think one of the things that come ac comes across in the data is it's this dance, right, that the Communist Party of China has been trying to do to promote economic growth while also maintaining control of Chinese society. And so, you know, what you see in those early years uh, in, in the index um, is, it is, is gradual improvement. It's gradual improvement of freedom after about 1995. Um, you know, this was a period of experimentation where, um, you know, things were really starting to open up. Um, people's, you know, state control was decreasing and people's lives were improving. You know, I went to China for the first time in 1981 as, as a child with my family. And I just, what I remember from that was the sameness of everything. Um, and yet, by sort of 1995 onwards, this, to this period that we're tracking, this is a time when China went from a place where everything had been provided by the state to a place where everything was being provided in markets, right? And that change was really significant. And so around that same time, the, the experimentation, I think, also extended to society and governance. Um, and this is where there's this impact on, on prosperity. You know, so you have projects like increasing women's political participation and enabling some public advocacy on some things. I mean, there were limits, right? This was post Tiananmen Square. Um, there were restrictions, there were controls, um, and it was particularly difficult for, for certain groups of people, which, which we can get into later. But then what you started to see around 2008, 2009 in the data is where things started to shift, right? You start to see the party trying to, these efforts to re-exert control, um, but maintain economic growth, maintain the prosperity. Um, and I think that context is really important to, to think about as we're, as we're looking, as I was looking at that, the indices. And so to kind of get to your question, the kind of three conclusions from the, the data that I wanted to highlight um, on prosperity in particular, you know, it's, it's underwhelming, uneven, and unequal, <laughs> right? Um, so, so first, I think I would say overall, the data is underwhelming, right? You have... China, we know, had this period of just phenomenal economic growth. 
Um, you know, but the Chinese people saw really only modest gains, if any, right, across a range of these freedom and prosperity indices. Um, you know, when you look at this in comparison to East Asia Pacific, um, other countries had improved freedoms, uh, even with slower economic growth, right? And so it just overall, they seem to do more with less. Um, and I, I found that really striking looking at the data um, in that comparative sense, this sense of just a really significant missed opportunity um, by the CCP to create a more modern and dynamic society, right? They had the means to do it and it didn't happen, you know, a society that could actually reflect the Chinese dream that Xi Jinping keeps talking about. Um, so, so that's one, one observation of, of where the pros it didn't translate into, into prosperity for, for Chinese people. The second sort of observation is the unevenness of that prosperity, right? It, it's unsurprising that the sort of most remarkable sort of trend, the most remarkable improvement came in economic prosperity, right? And that is, it should absolutely be recognized as this achievement by the party, by the government, and by the Chinese people. Um, but it's a very complex reality in China, right? At a very basic level, China's economic growth has been uneven because certain areas got priority and preferential treatment over others. And, and this has generally been sort of seen as sort of urban coastal areas that got preference compared to sort of the rural sort of inland away from the coast areas, right? And so while GDP per, per capita um, might average out to look like growth, um, there's a lot of poverty in China sort of outside of urban centers. And I think very importantly, and this really comes through in the data, that unevenness of how prosperity is distributed is not, it's not just uneven economically. It basically, if you fall outside of sort of some accepted norms of what the Parsi says, such as if you belong to a religious or ethnic minority, your quality of life is significantly worse than the average person, right? And so, you know, what I take from that is that while, while a lack of progress on certain kinds of freedoms, you know, it could be explainable at least by the party's instinct to retain control, I think the, the inability to deliver more equitable prosperity to citizens by the CCP, that just seems like a missed opportunity. And then to, your, to, to the last one, you know, my final conclusion about this, what seems to be this CCP commitment to just an unequal form of governance. Right. Since the beginning of the Communist Party of China, it has, it has sort of touted this collectivist approach that it has, right? The well-being of the collective was more important than the well-being of the individual, right? But what, what the data really shows, I think, um, is that it's actually a more selective approach. There are certain groups that are favored at the expense of others, right? Now, this inequality, that's not new within the CCP system, right? There's always been winners and losers. You have party elites, you have their affiliated businesses. They rake in the benefits of this extraordinary growth. Well, you know, ordinary citizens see sort of much more modest gains. Um, but again, what I think the data shows is what I see is a shift towards a much more absolute rather than a relative sense of inequality, right? There are clear losers in this system. Um, and not only have they not made gains, they've actually seen really significant losses in their freedoms. And so again, it's groups like ethnic and religious minorities, women, the LGBTQ plus community, right? These are groups that challenge the party's claims to legitimacy and they have not seen the benefits at all of the prosperity that could have that could have come. Thank you very much. Before we turn to uh, Ambassador Curry, I would just want to remind uh, those in the audience and at home to send us your questions at askac.org, and we will get to those. Kelly, you're focusing on Burma in new research. Can you shed some light on? Uh, countries trying new models and what works versus the development models that have fallen short. Um, well, thank you, and it's um, it's really wonderful to be able to participate on this panel and learn from my colleagues. And also, I was really ruminating on some of the things that our keynote speaker this morning, Damon Asimoglu, said about how what is causing the regression in democracy and how that relates to, to the paper that I'm working on um, for the council. And the project this paper is nested within that compares authoritarian development models, mostly the Chinese development model, 
with what I call the development industrial complex approach that the West has mm -hmm. basically defaulted to. And I say that because I do feel like we have defaulted to a somewhat lazy um, institutional ecosystem of organizations, whether it's the Bretton Woods Institutes or our own bilateral aid agencies or um, the multilateral aid agencies, um, all of these things, they are like, you know, we make jokes about the blob in terms of foreign policy, but there's also a development blob. And that is basically what the West uses to promote economic development in the world. And neither, it's not serving our interests very well right now, and it's not serving the interests of the developing world very well either. And I'll give you a good example before I get to get to Burma. Um, this Just this week, the World Bank came out with a new survey that um, talked about what the priorities for were for its clients, what it's what the clients' priorities are, the borrowers, the countries that the bank is supposed to be helping guide toward prosperity and support in that process. And out of 17 topics that the banks, a list of 17 topics, climate was number 11 for for the the they wanted education, they want health care, they want jobs development, they want good governance and public administration, the clients, the, the developing countries. It's the, the shareholders, the, the donor countries that are pushing this climate agenda. Now, are there, of course, countries like the low-lying island states where climate is an existential threat and they need real support on there so that they can give health care, education, and jobs to their populations? Of course. But in the aggregate, most of the World Bank's climate uh, clients are not, in, are not prioritizing climate change. It's the donor-driven behavior. And so this is a pathology that we see over and over again in the way that we approach these countries. And Burma is a great example, and it's also a great way. Burma, I chose Burma as the first case study for what will be, a, we hope, a series of papers looking at how these different development <laughs> models that China is putting out in the world and that the Western industrialized democracies are putting out in the world how they actually play out on the ground where they are where they are not meeting the needs of these countries because this this paper on Burma basically shows that both of these models failed in Burma hmm. and continue to fail abjectly. Um, between, and it looks at this 15 year period, right, between 2009 and, and now. Um, where you saw Burma go from being a pariah state that was ruled by a military regime that was one of the worst, most regressive in the world. They were the, one of the lowest recipients per capita of overseas development assistance in the world. And they were had socioeconomic indicators that were at sub-Saharan African levels. They were down in the least developed band, bottom 10%, just as they are today. But they've gone, for, they've gone in a circle, right? They went from that. Between, in that 15-year period, they had a managed transition to a more democratic or at least more open and accountable form of governance over a 10-year period where the military stepped back from direct rule, allowed a quasi-civilian um, institution to come in. As soon as the West decided that it was good enough for the Burmese people, which was not very good, I will be very clear here, the military still had ultimate control, the economy was still um, dominated by rent-seeking cronies who owed their, um, their wealth and their, their ability to do business to their ties to the military, the military still itself had a huge chunk of the economy. Like All of these things were still in place. Burma was still spending 1% of its GDP on health and education. But that's not good, just for, in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, you know, but the, the West decided, yeah, good enough for us. Um, soft bigotry of low expectations. We're going to flood the zone. We're going to change Burma from being a conflict fragile, you know, conflict affected fragile state into a transition. And we're going to start throwing our transition toolkit at them. And just we're all in. Literally 10 percent of the po of the parliament at that point was represented by a popularly elected party. The rest were still the military's holdover. But the, the world just was like, yeah, we're good. We're good with that. The Burmese people, of course, were not. They continued to repudiate this, and they continued to ask for different things, both politically, economically, and socially from the international community, but we didn't listen. We imposed our toolkits and our models and our technical assistance on them, and the results were not good. 
In the meantime, China had never left Burma. They didn't care what kind of government was there. They cared about their interests, which were getting access, as Joe talks about the coastal areas in China, these inland areas in southwest China, landlocked, not benefiting from this big economic boom. The Chinese leadership was like, ooh, we can go through Burma and get to the Indian Ocean. This will be awesome for us. Let's build a giant port in Burma. Boom. They start building a giant port and connecting it through an oil and gas pipeline and transportation corridor. And this is their new string of pearl strategy. They're doing it in Gwadar and in Pakistan, and they're doing it in Jokpu in Burma. Did they care that they were building that pipeline through areas where there was a civil war going on? Oh, heck no, they did not. They're paying off people on both sides. They're selling weapons to people on both sides. They do not care. Can we go in and do that? N no, no, we cannot. But that's what they're doing. So when things open up, the, Biden, uh, the Obama administration um, decided, again, part of the calculus here of why we rushed in despite and, and flooded this gold rush. Joe was there. She remembers what it was like. It was insane. We just, like, the number of World Bank, IMF, you know, EU development, USAID, DFID, um, AUSAID, Norway, all of them, just like, it was insane. It was, I, 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 I don't overstate it to say that it was insane. Um, all these people coming in with their technical assistance and their toolkits and all of this stuff and, and overwhelming civil society, overwhelming the Burmese. Meanwhile, China's just chugging along, doing what they do, identifying an interest and doing whatever they need to do to accomplish it. And we are like all over the place. They did have a bump in Burma where the Burmese government canceled a big dam project or suspended a big dam project. <laughs> China got mad at first. They blamed the United States for it when it was really, they misunderstood that the Burmese people really wanted this um, project canceled. But instead of, but after their initial kind of pouting about it, they went to work. They started taking NLD members on study tours of China. They started taking ethnic leaders on study tours of China. They stopped just paying attention to the government and started paying attention to all these civil society people. Meanwhile, we, the West, who had spent Decades supporting civil society, providing support to them outside of the country, inside of the country, supporting the NLD and their fight for democracy. All our attention is being paid to the government people in Naypyidaw, and we're kind of halfway paying a little bit of attention to the civil society and the ethnics, and, and China's focused on them like a laser beam. It, we've like basically done everything possible wrong in Burma that we could. China has done basically what for their own interests makes sense, but it's also been a disaster for the Burmese people. Today, Burma is back and under military rule directly. There is a massive civil war going on. You cannot not blame China for part of it because of their willingness to back the military at all costs and their willingness to ignore human rights and democracy concerns. But you also cannot not blame us because we did the same thing. We tried to, to sort of do a China light approach where we'd have some concerns about human rights and democracy and freedom. But really, at the end of the day, if we could get our companies in there on the ground, if we could, you know, get get our military talking to their military and, and address our, our geopolitical concerns, we were much more focused on doing those things than we were on what do the Burmese people want? What do they need? And so we were continually surprised by what the Burmese people wanted and what did they need because we never really bothered to ask them, at least our government didn't. So there's a lot that you can learn from this context, I think. And I think it, it's a very good illustration of how we misunderstand and, and misunderestimate, to use a good George W. Bush <laughs> word, what it is our partners want, mostly because we don't ever ask or listen to them when, we, when they try to tell us. It also shows that we don't always articulate ourselves or even show a lot of fidelity and belief in this idea that freedom is essential to prosperity. We go around the world saying this and acting in a completely different way. The, and, and we don't, we fail to acknowledge that our principles are our superpowers. And instead, when we go around and, and because we put out these principles, but then we turn around and act in completely unprincipled ways on the ground, it, it's, it's really, undermines us and how we can do things. And a big piece of this is that 
you know, we because we use this development industrial complex that spends a lot of time talking to itself, building itself up, and and you know coming up with toolkits and jobs for you know graduates of elite universities in Western developed countries instead of trying to figure out what it is that people on the ground want. We, we miss a lot of opportunities and we've created this system that is not only not effective in, in meeting the needs of these developing countries and it's really annoys the crap out of most Americans, taxpayers too, when they see all of this stuff going on and most, most developed democracy country taxpayers too. And so nobody's happy with our system and it's not accomplishing anything for the people it's supposed to accomplish for. So I think we need to really start to rethink about how we're doing this. And I think putting freedom back at the center of it is the very first step that we need to take. And I'll stop there. Th thank, thank you very much. Um, so, so we've talked about Japan and Burma and China. Uh, Dr. Shio Jiri, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, South Korea, the Republic of Korea. And so can you touch on U.S., uh, Republic of Korea, Japan relations? And obviously Korea is doing great on the index. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so I think uh, the recent development of the trilateral relationship is remarkable. Uh, we had the Camp David summit, and afterwards we had uh, several rounds of uh, ministerial level, working level, and development in the economic security uh, uh, area as well. And I think uh, Prime Minister Kishida is coming to D.C. in April, but before that in March, uh, I think it's March 20, he's going to Seoul, and then after that he will come to D.C., so there's a sequence there. So I believe that there are trilateral relations that are developing, and uh, related to the idea of FOIP, I think uh, South Korea also developed its uh, own Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, and U.S. also has uh, its own Indo-Pacific strategy, and they uh, collaborate each other, and uh, which uh, resonates with uh, what uh, Ambassador uh, told us about uh, what is it that our partners want is also something that is uh, very important and what U.S., Japan, and South Korea can collaborate on. Uh, so I believe there are a lot of things happening uh, uh, in the political level and also the implementation level, which obviously needs more time to develop, but I think one of the fields that they are working on and that I, I'm uh, focused on is economic security uh, area, the uh, sustainability and economic um, security and how to deter economic coercion uh, in the region is one of the topics that I'm very interested in, in in terms of this trilateral relationship. Thank you very much. Johanna, so you mentioned that your portfolio includes 23 countries. Mm -hmm. So um, what other models uh, can you offer uh, the audience that work or absolutely failing? Well, I mean, I actually was wanting to pick up on what Kelly was talking about because, you know, I think the the ways in which we you know we as the US really need to rethink how we are approaching the countries with which with whom we want to partner um, the countries who we see as allies or at least as strategic partners um, really needs a rethink and, and I would throw out Indonesia um, as a case that that deserves that sort of warrants attention because you know this is a place where I think the US has 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 really not done a very good job of of understanding what uh, making an effort to understand what it is that that Indonesians are looking for from the relationship and understanding sort of where Indonesia is in itself. I mean, this is a country that you know all the superlatives, right? It just had the largest single day election <laughs> in the world. Um, it's the largest Muslim majority country. It's the third largest democracy, right? It is also geostrategically incredibly important, just because of the size of its economy, but also because of its location. Um, you know, when Kelly was talking about sort of the way in which China has been making its inroads in, in Burma because of the work it has put in to building relationships. We see very similar patterns in Indonesia where you know, the CCP has been taking people to, you know, on party exchanges to Beijing. Um, they have been buying up the media space and ensuring that, there's the, that they have influence through various channels in that way. You know, and, and I think our approach, unfortunately, has been, you know, Indonesia is a democracy. Indonesian people put tremendous amount of investment of themselves into their democracy. Um, and at a certain point, sort of, I don't know, Kelly, it was sort of like in the mid 2010s, I think, the U.S. sort of essentially said, well, Indonesia's done. We're, it's, a, it's a democracy, and we don't, we don't need to engage with it in the same way. And that, that's fine. But I, I think Indonesian people, Indonesian stakeholders, we're still struggling. And, I, and what's happened over the last decade has been 
an erosion of the democratic institutions that Indonesian people worked so hard and fought so hard to 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 sustain, um, and that's where you know I, I do think. It's, it warrants that larger rethink um, that Kelly was talking about. Of how are we approaching um, these kinds of partnerships? And, and if we're leading with, with our values, which we should, um, what does that look like in a context of understanding where, where our partners, what, what they need from us and how, how we can cooperate with them? I know at my time at the Export-Import Bank, uh, 2019 to 2021, worked really hard to stand up a new program called China and Transformational Experts. Exports. Congress gave Exim the ability to match the rate terms and conditions mm -hmm. that the Chinese Communist Party was offering to a foreign buyer of uh, made in the USA goods or services. We wanted the world to buy American. Not um, We know we make the best goods in the world, but that's also important uh, for freedom in, in many ways. Ways. And one of those technologies that we focused on was something that Dan Negre also worked on at the State Department through something called the Deal Team with Undersecretary Keith Kroc. And that was on um, uh, technology such as 5G. And uh, worked really hard with the prior leadership in Indonesia and in other key countries. And uh, what's happening on this, this, this world of uh, technology? I was frustrated to see the Solomon Islands uh, sign up the Chinese Communist Party's 5G system instead of America's uh, last year. But uh, what, what do you see on the technology front? Well, I think, again, it's not that they have better tech. Um, they have cheaper tech, that's for sure, and they subsidize the heck out of it so that it it's stays cheaper and we can't compete on the price. Um, we can only compete on quality and we can only compete on wrapping it around. It's got to, you know, we've got to come in with not just here's the tech, but it's the wraparound services. If you look at a lot of the projects that China has done in the past 10 years on the Belt and Road, one of the things that we keep seeing is that they put, they come in with a lot of pledges and a lot of fanfare and they build something and then it sits there and it they forget to train people on how to operate it it they don't have a maintenance budget for how to keep it up and the, the and it falls apart and so all of these things I mean again China is learning they're not standing still they are figuring out what they're doing wrong and taking steps to correct it and so you've seen this with the Belt and Road how they've like said we're going to have higher quality um, you know, higher quality projects now, but that's a direct reaction to what we were doing where we lean into quality and we lean into higher standards to, to force a change in their behavior, which I think was really important part of what was done by Dan and Keith Kroc and others. I was on a trip with Keith Kroc, to, and, but it's also something we can't just do by ourselves. And this is where our partners in Japan, our partners in South Korea, um, our partners in Taiwan. I went with Keith on a trip to Taiwan where we were talking about um, what ultimately became the CHIPS Act and building the FAB in Arizona and, the, and how hard it was and continues to be. You know, we're still resolving tax issues for the Taiwanese. We make it hard on ourselves in a lot of ways. And part of that is that we don't have a good way to explain, you know, we need to make sure that what we're doing is just as understandable to somebody in Tulsa as it is to somebody in Taipei. That it's just, you know, that somebody in Des Moines and somebody in Dushanbe can clearly understand what it is we're doing, why we're doing it, and what they're going to get from it. Like, we don't do that. We don't even try most of the time. We are so technocratic and so talking to ourselves about this stuff all the time. I mean, I, I, I love the fact that there is a platform called DevX that is literally like the in-house news organ of the development community, but that's also kind of a horrifying thing. You read it and it's like, does, it, does everybody know about this stuff? I mean, it's really wild what we're doing and how we don't do a great job. Technology is our friend in that way. We can use it to help explain what we're doing better, but it also becomes a lazy default where we think if we put something out there, that means that that's done. Like, we tweet it and that's it. It's like, no, you can't tweet it and forget it. You actually have to really make more of an effort to explain to our own taxpayers in, in our developed um, democracies who are the donors funding this stuff and to the people who are meant to be the beneficiaries, what it is we're doing. But we've also got to become much more ruthless about getting rid of the stuff that doesn't work. We can't just keep this stuff around because it worked 10 years ago or 20 years ago. We've got to look at this and say, is it fit for purpose? Is it doing what we want it to do? And 
if it's not, then we need to dump it and get rid of it. And we don't have the luxury of keeping around legacy projects and institutions that are not fit to purpose in the world that we live in now and the competition that we're facing today. If I could just jump in on the technology piece to pick up on what Kelly was saying, I think the other layer of technology is, of course, the use, the export uh, by China of surveillance technologies mm -hmm. um, the, into countries across the Indo-Pacific. Um, and again, going back to really needing to both work with countries, work with our partners to help build an understanding of what are the risks? What, what, what are they getting when they bring these technologies in? But I think also listening to people, right? Listening to the concerns of civil societies in the countries in which these, these things are being brought in. What are the concerns about privacy? What are their concerns about access to information? And are there ways that we can be constructive and helpful um, in ensuring that the free, the, the free space, the space for free exchange, the, free, the space for free association can continue to exist? But I thought Damon made a really good point this morning, though, about how the United States, we're, we're happy to give all our data to an unaccountable corporate entity, but we're very protective of the government having our data. And then in other contexts, you know, it's the opposite. And I think, you know, the Europeans have a different system. And then China is out there marketing a model that's very attractive to your average country, developing or not. And I think that we've got to be conscious of how our own policy decisions domestically and the way that we think about data protection and all of and privacy impact how we then go out in the world and and sound crazy when we're like yeah you should do what we do with the social media and that people are like yeah no thanks that's terrible <laughs> yeah, I, I could jump in a little bit that uh, the economic coercion is is, is somewhat uh, close to the technology field and economy field and I think there are studies in Australia and, and Germany that has done that uh, the China's co coercion cases there has been more than 100 cases over the last 10 years so how to deter those is one of the uh, core uh, a field that we can work on together as US, Japan, and South Korea, and other countries. And I think that's where uh, we need to work uh, on it uh, with the freedom and prosperity uh, in mind as well. Mm -hmm. Well, not received any questions yet. Again, askac.org. You've just got a few seconds to send it in, but uh, we'll watch the screen here. And uh, to close us out quickly, I'd love just three suggestions from each of you on what all of the countries in the Indo-Pacific region should be doing to move up their freedom and prosperity scores in the index. What, what are your recommendations? I mean, I think I'd pick up on, on the things we've been talking about of partnership. Uh, you know, I, I think the, 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 the learning that can be done when we're, we're actually really making the effort to understand where, where these countries are coming from and what their needs are. And I think particularly with, the, with, the, with our colleague from Japan, um, you know, Japan and Korea and the opportunity that's there for these democracies and Taiwan to be taking more of a leadership role um, in, in, helping, in helping bridge some of these, these, these connections and partnerships, um, I think is going to be very important. And I um, uh, agree, um, uh, more, I can't agree more, but I think the important phrase that, uh, from Kelly is that what is it that our partners want mm -hmm. is uh, that uh, struck out uh, to me as well. And, and in my opening uh, remarks, I said that uh, it is a second approach uh, and uh, attitude that we need to build on, and that's something that we need to do. And uh, I believe that is one of the important things. And I think the study like uh, Atlantic Council is doing about uh, the relationship between freedom and prosperity, I think that matters. And the power of those studies in academic world also uh, matters in politics as well. So I uh, thank for Atlantic Council and thank you for being here. And mine's pretty straightforward, women. If you look at the region and you disaggregate out the growth over the past 20 years, the biggest contributor, and I wrote the chapter on this for the, the book, the, um, the map, if women's ac economic participation had not grown the way it has in the Indo-Pacific region, growth would essentially be flat across the region. I was stunned, and I was the US ambassador at large for global women's issues, and I was stunned to see this in the data because I figured education, healthcare improvements, um, regulatory environment improvements that would have more, it was women's workforce participation, boom. That is it. It's like a huge, huge key. China's going in the opposite direction. They're trying to you know, force women to have babies instead of working. They're making it harder for women to work. And if you want to grow your economy, 
it's one word, women. Yeah. Well, with that, I also <laughs> want to say it's women in small business. The world um, that's loves. What they're, that's where they work, yeah. by yeah. the way. So with that, let's thank our panelists. Thank you so much, and uh, looking forward to freedom in the Indo-Pacific. <laughs>
welcome to the panel on economic freedom and democracy in the Middle East and North Africa. My name is Nina Danawi. I'm an associate director at the Freedom and Prosperity Center, and I'll be moderating this panel. Uh, joining me today is Rabah Areski. Rabah is a former vice president at the African Development Bank, a former chief economist at the World Bank Middle East and North Africa region, and a former chief of commodities at the IMF's research department. He's now a professor and director of research at the French National Center for Scientific Research, a senior fellow at the Foundation for Studies and Research on International Development at Harvard Kennedy School. Also joining us today is Senator Mohamed Farid. Mohamed is an Egyptian senator and deputy chair for the Committee on Human Rights and Social Solidarity, as well as a founding member of the Cairo Liberal Club. Previously, he held leadership roles in the Free Egyptian Party and the Egyptian Engineer Syndicate. Welcome. Thank you. And finally, joining us online is Rasha Helwa. Rasha is a director of Empower Me Initiative at the Atlantic Council Rafiq Hariri Center for the Middle East. She's a senior economist with 25 years of professional experience in economic and financial policy analysis and implementation, and has worked in the private sector, government, and academia in the US, UK, France, and Egypt. Welcome. So let's start our discussion now with our first question to Rabah. Rabah, how has democracy in the MENA region evolved over time, specifically in relation to economic freedom, and what causes differences between countries in the region? Thank you, Nina. Thank you for, for having me. So the, the region is notorious uh, to have suffered a, a democratic uh, deficit. Um, the situation has been fairly stagnant uh, until the uh, so-called Arab Spring, uh, which uh, the region witnessed. So it was a burst of, uh, uh, you know, language for democracy. Uh, you know, the, the people of the region were longing for, for, for democracy, for, for freedom. Unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, we are over uh, 10 years uh, from the Arab Spring, and uh, we, uh, there was an important backlash uh, uh, following this uh, eruption of democracy, of freedom. Uh, protests did lead to free election, but this election did uh, yield, uh, um, you know, a backlash uh, to uh, uh, autocratic uh, rule, um, and uh, as a result, we uh, we are now in this uh, back to this more stagnant uh, uh, situation of uh, freedom and and uh, um, and, and prosperity. Uh, economic uh, the economic uh, situation is also quite dire and I would say across the board in the, in the region even so one could distinguish on the economic front the performance of uh, several Gulf countries uh, which I think the Atlas document very well where there is uh, um, the example of Saudi Arabia which is uh, launching that uh, massive economic transformation program is, uh, is certainly one to, uh, uh, to take note of and, and perhaps uh, uh, watch uh, for others in the region to follow. Uh, but of course, uh, the, there are also important tension, uh, conflict uh, uh, in the region that also may define the future of, uh, uh, of democracy and prosperity. And um, we've got to find solution uh, on the security and peace front to move toward that uh, uh, agenda of, uh, of prosperity and freedom. Thank you, Rabah, uh, and thank you also for contributing to our Atlas book for the chapter on uh, MENA and chapters on Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so now moving to Egypt and to Mohammed, uh, as we reflect on Egypt post-Arab Spring journey, how does Egypt experience compare with broader MENA trends in political and economic transitions? Well, looking at the trend uh, at the region, there are similarities and differences. But let me first start by what Rabah uh, uh, eloquently uh, mentioned in the book. There are three different groups of uh, the countries in the Middle East, uh, in MENA region, that uh, <coughs> transferred their economy, the high speed ones like the GCC, the moderate speed, where Egypt and most of North Africa, Lebanon and Jordan too, and finally the lower speed. Egypt is the modern speed, uh -huh. but Egypt by far the largest 
whether in population and in the economy. Mm -hmm. And let that sink in for a moment, mm -hmm. because I'll get back again yeah. to it. Yeah. <laughs> Egypt historically struggled with achieving prosperity and freedom. Mm -hmm. It has been, as long as the data covers, been mostly unfree, mm -hmm. mostly unprosperous. In the past 10 years, Egypt faced a compound of challenges. Mm -hmm. I presume it was unprecedented to have all these amount of challenges, you know, in, in, in the same time, mm -hmm. uh, in the same period, starting from two revolutionary waves, mm -hmm. moving toward a war and terror in Sinai, mm -hmm. adding to that uh, massive regional instability, whether there was on every single border of Egypt, there is a civil war or an instability even on the maritime borders. Mm -hmm. Uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine, uh, repercussion of that, uh, disruption in the, uh, in, the, in the supply chains, mm -hmm. and uh, unfavorable uh, macroeconomic environment globally where there is money, uh, sorry, monetary tightening. Mm -hmm. These have its toll on the Egyptian economy and its pursuit on uh, freedom and prosperity, but it's not the root cause. The root cause, in my opinion, that Egypt uh, economy is a, is a state-led economy. It's not a market-led economy. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, this economic model characterized with heavy state intervention created structural uh, deformation, limiting economic uh, freedom, uh, contracting the private sector, uh, uh, crowding it out, creating more distortions mm -hmm. in the economy, making it more dependent on either uh, non-tradable uh, sectors like real estate, uh, construction, uh, infrastructure, or uh, vulnerable uh, <coughs> to external shock, vulnerable sectors mm -hmm. to external shocks like Suez Canal uh, revenues, tourism, and remittance. Yet, uh, this, this commitment to state uh, driven economy um, was always been uh, thought of as a reason for stability. I mean, uh, among many of decision makers and even politicians, they think that if the state can provide the jobs, can create jobs, provide services, goods, this will create stability. And after the Arab Spring, this uh, rationale had been renewed because many, uh, many thought thought that the revolution broke out due to the resentment of the youth against Mubarak mm -hmm. and his elites who were business people. Surprisingly, this in an ominous way resonates with what Hayek once said, that whoever controls means must decide which ends and um, they are to serve. And uh, under modern conditions, control of economic activity means control of material means of particularly all our ends. It means control over nearly all our activities. Mm -hmm. Of course, Hayek meant total another thing that what actually happened, but having said that, mm -hmm. uh, I still uh, have some optimism. Mm -hmm. um, back again to the point that I was mentioned early that mm -hmm. Egypt by, by far the largest economy in this group, mm -hmm. uh, this, this opportunity uh, to use the current challenges as uh, a way to channel more reforms. Mm -hmm. For example, right now, while we're talking, there is the second phase of a national dialogue specialized on economy that have been launched a year ago. I personally uh, actively engaged in that and many other uh, different political players from the entire political spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, probably for the first time, we see uh, a real action from the government regarding uh, privatizing the management of airports. And for that, it used to be a taboo, a no-no, a big no-no. Mm -hmm. So, so the, we shouldn't waste a good crisis, mm -hmm. you know, and there might be a silver lining in this crisis to push for uh, reforms. It still has to be uh, patient. You have to be patient. And it has to be accumulated, you know, uh, one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and now moving to Russia. Um, Russia, how are MENA country progressing in meeting the Sustainable Development Goals and the 23 Agenda? Uh, thank you, Nina. A very timely discussion, given that the 2030 Agenda has been almost forgotten uh, globally, uh, and the MENA region is not an uh, exception to that. So in general, the Middle East and North Africa region doesn't score highly in terms of achieving the SDGs. Um, the average score is about 58 
out of 100, uh, one being the lowest, 100 being the highest, that's the average. Yet there are positive trends uh, in three key areas, at least in the region. Um, education is one, uh, SDG4, affordable and clean energy, SDG7, and climate action, SDG13. Uh, despite this progress, however, there are different challenges uh, that persist, uh, particularly regarding uh, gender equality, that's SDG number five, poverty and hunger, SDGs one and two, uh, health and well-being, SG3, clean water and sanitation, industry and infrastructure, peace, justice, and strong institutions, uh, which is SDG number 16. Now, if we look at each country separately, uh, the six best performing countries in the region in terms of achieving the SDGs uh, to a large extent are um, Tunisia, uh, Morocco, Algeria, Jordan, the UAE, and Egypt. On the other hand, Syria, Libya, and Yemen are, are the least performing in terms of SDG attainment because overall uh, poor and conflict affected nations uh, face substantial challenges across at least 10, 10 out of the 17 SDGs. Um, and coming back to what has been discussed by others, including Mohammed just before me, uh, it's worth noting also that the recent exogenous shocks, including the pandemic crisis, Ukraine-Russia conflict, the recent Israel-Gaza war, uh, have strained the region's uh, economies, uh, diverting public resources that could have been invested in social sectors like healthcare and education um, to rather respond to these crises, the impact of those in terms of inflation, et cetera. So many countries in the region are basically still struggling to overcome the social uh, and economic impact of these shocks. Um, so, you know, the hope is the region has already hosted two COPs uh, recently, which really helped raise momentum uh, and awareness about the impact of climate change in the region, uh, and really hoping to be able to revive the discussion around the other 16 SDGs uh, in order to meet the goals of the 2030 agenda. Thank you, Rasha. Um, and now moving back to you, Rabah and question about cooperation. So how, how can the regional cooperation and integration initiative enhance economic resilience and prosperity in the MENA region? Uh, thank you, uh, Nina. So the, uh, the region is one of the least integrated in, in the world. And uh, to understand that, my theory, uh, which is uh, very much akin to what the senator just, uh, just mentioned, is the presence of the state in the economy at the domestic level reverberate in bilateral relationship. If you have politicized, if you wish, the domestic economy, when you try and invest in a neighbor, the neighbor very much looks at the potential investment from a private uh, entity as potentially a state uh, uh, investment. And as a result, uh, I think we, we got to that low equilibrium where integration is, is very low. So I think the, the solution I, I, uh, you know, to more integration should be in, in trying to roll back uh, the role of the state uh, uh, in the economy so as to let this, uh, fl you know, large, uh, fairly large region flourish uh, through more cross-border and trade. Uh, I think that that's, uh, that's important. I also uh, want to um, uh, draw your attention on a, on a trend which uh, we, we see happening with the, um, the uh, special economic zone that are uh, flourishing in the region, uh, and notably between um, you know Saudis and, and UAE, the, uh, uh, the flourishing of these special economic zones. Uh, very much an ambition to try and um, take advantage of, uh, of uh, the wonders of the global economy, yet it is potentially fragmenting um, uh, common markets. Uh, indeed, the rivalry between UAE and, uh, uh, and Saudi is very much uh, uh, at play. So the region has to try and come together while trying to be very much open to the rest of the world. So uh, I think we s what we see at play in the region is, is also uh, happening uh, in other parts of the world. So while we think that new geopolitics is going to bring about more regional blocks, within this block we see this tension and rivalry uh, uh, 
uh, operating between uh, different actors. So we've got to also think uh, through how uh, this, uh, this fl uh, special economic zone, which are fragmenting common frameworks, uh, if you wish, across, across the region, um, have to be squared. Otherwise, we, uh, we will end up in uh, more rivalry, which is somewhat uh, you know, healthy, but which uh, make the region lose the opportunity to integrate uh, uh, among its other. Thank you, Rabah. And uh, maybe we keep the same topic and shift to Egypt. Uh, Mohammed, how can Egypt leverage a strategic position to lead regional cooperation efforts and sh uh, for shared priority in the region? Well, you know, it's, it's funny enough that th this region, the, the MENA region, historically have been uh, in the center of economic integration and in the center of free trade by the time. And yet there is also uh, a lot of legal uh, framework that uh, bilateral trade agreements or multilateral trade agreements, but with a very little or almost none um, impact on the ground. The, for example, um, looking at the energy, which is really important uh, sector, uh, the uh, only 2% of electricity produced in MENA region is traded between the countries, despite there is a lot of interconnectivity between the different grids. Uh, projects focused on electrical in interconnectivity, infrastructure development, uh, underscore potential for greater economic independence and collaboration. There are some success stories in that field, you know, Egypt led through, like the uh, Qualified Industrial Zones, the QIZ, between Egypt, Jordan, Israel, and the United States. It, it helped creating um, a lot of, uh, of prosperity for the people and stabilized and ensured peace between these countries. Adding to that, the uh, Mediterranean Gas Forum, the East, East, East Mediterranean Gas Forum, and this shows, showcase also ability to forge mutual benefit, beneficial economic partnerships. Um, these initiatives could, could possibly help, you know, uh, integrating, do more integration. Moreover, the involvement uh, of Egypt in the Negev Forum uh, presents further opportunities for integration and cooperation. This platform uh, for dialogue among countries who had the, uh, signed the Abrahamic Accord and, and signed peace treaties with Israel uh, can, can, can be a foundation to build more uh, of economic uh, and multilateral uh, integration and trade. Uh, so, uh, by, by, by promoting policies and in encouraging economic integration, we can mitigate the conflict, enhance stability and create prosperous region and collaborate, uh, collab collaborative uh, frameworks. And we have already success stories. We need to either invest more into it or to replicate it to a wider scope. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Mohammed. Uh, now back to you, Rasha. Uh, how do poverty and inequality impact economic development in the middle-income MENA countries, uh, such as Egypt, Jordan, Tunisia, and Morocco? Uh, thank you, Nina. So I always like to use numbers uh, just to give an indication of the extent of the problem. And the MENA region is one of the most unequal regions uh, worldwide mm -hmm. in terms of both income and gender inequalities. So on income, 60% of the region's wealth is processed by only 10% of the population. And income inequality can actually be witnessed in two ways, uh, between countries uh, within the region. Uh, so there is a significant gap, for example, between the oil exporting countries and the oil importing countries and within the same country. So, for example, in the case of Egypt and Morocco, uh, there are significant income inequality, inequalities between rural and urban households. Um, at the same time, uh, the region is also one of the slowest in the world to show progress on gender equality. Um, and this has been uh, shown in multiple indicators, uh, including education, healthcare, and labor markets. Um, so how is this really impactful? And like as a result, women's part participation in the labor force is very compromised uh, in many countries. So for example, the labor force participation uh, by female um, averages at 15% in Egypt, uh, well below the mean. Uh, 20%, um, actually 15% also in Jordan, 21% uh, in Morocco, 26% in Tunisia. 28% in Lebanon. 
this is definitely low and and if, if you want to think about it um, in terms of opportunity cost, you can think about it as um, you know missing out on up to 35% of the contribution towards GDP because these females could have been in the market if they had access to skills uh, and to uh, labor force. Thank you, Rasha. Um, Okay, uh, back to you, Rabah, and maybe we can talk a bit about media freedom. Uh, what role does media freedom play in fostering democratic governance and accountability in MENA region? And what are challenge, challenges to ensuring a free media landscape? Yeah. So this is one of the most uh, worrisome trend, uh, I must say, in the, in the region. Uh, the number of journalists killed, jailed, uh, is staggering. And, uh, uh, and of course, it participates of a global trend where we see regression in uh, in freedom, uh, freedom of the press, uh, and as well as other freedom. Uh, um, uh, and um, unfortunately, uh, this is a, a sad example where we, uh, by encouraging more freedom, uh, we could uh, get more support for for prosperity. And uh, the the channel I see is very much that. Uh, well, as the senator just mentioned earlier, this was a region uh, which culture was very much rooted in trade, um, uh, has now fallen back in terms of its support for markets. And media freedom, uh, as well as think tanks, uh, such as the council here, uh, do not have uh, a say in the region. They're, there's very limited freedom. Uh, it's not it's not true across the board but uh, we we see regression on that on that freedom uh, across the board in in the region and uh, if uh, if the region keeps on um, uh, limiting uh, that that press freedom the freedom of think tank to operate to analyze data which uh, times have also been scarce in the in the in the region We'll, uh, we'll see more regression on the support for market and therefore for reform and more for uh, even more state presence. Uh, and that would be very unfortunate uh, for prosperity as well as obviously for, for freedom. Thank you, Rabah. Uh, uh, and now back to you, Mohammed, and maybe we can talk a bit about youth. Uh, how can Egypt empower its uh, young generation to drive political participation and promote democratic values? Well, you know, Egypt is an ancient country, but surprisingly, a very young nation. The uh, percentage of young people aging from 18 and 29, and 18 is the, uh, is the age of voting, are 22% of the population. There are around 3.5 million young Egyptians enrolled in higher education. So um, the, Egyptian the Egyptian youth also shown their potential uh, as a driver for change whether in the Arab Spring and the following uh, events for that. But uh, for over half a century in Egypt, there was a significant gap in genuine interest and, uh, uh, and, and opportunity for uh, young people for political participation. This led them either to apathy or radicalization. And of course, we see the impact of this uh, apathy or, uh, or, or radicalization happening after that. Uh, after the revolution, there was a shifting happening. For, for example, a uh, number of the members of the parliament, and we have two chambers, but I'm talking about the House of, Represent of Representatives. In 2010, just right before the revolution, the percentage of uh, uh, members of the parliament under 35, there were, they were 8%. The year after, in 2012, when the first election after the revolution, it was 11%. Last election, 2020, it went up to 21%. So there is a shifting happening. It takes time. Yeah, it, it's a decade, but let's look at it again. It's just two parliamentary terms. So there is still hope, you know, and there is an opportunity. Um, other than that, there were some initiatives uh, for empowering uh, young people. There was a presidential uh, initiative uh, called the uh, Presidential Leadership Program, and it materialized out by seeing uh, a significant number of young uh, politicians uh, holding uh, executive uh, offices, whether deputy uh, ministers or deputy governors. This used to be perceived as a taboo before that. Now we see this. It's a little bit of change, but it's not enough. It's a, it's, it's, it, we are 
105 million or 110 now probably and increasing while we talk, you know, uh, population. So it's, 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 it's even that it's not enough. It needs uh, to, to, to be more systematic. If we listen, if we, if we learn the lesson from the work of this, uh, of the, of the center of freedom and prosperity, it means it, 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 the lesson is that democracy and, and, and freedom and prosperity are interrelated and we need to remove the barriers. Removing the barriers, meaning to uh, allow more participation for younger people, especially uh, young women, you know, in the market and in the political field. Adding to that also the freedom of organization and the freedom of expression. These are important tools because by the end of the day, if you'd like the people to actively engage in politics, they need to be able to have the opportunity to express themselves freely and for even for the candidates to be able to put forward platforms. Plus that, of course, the, uh, the, the freedom of information so they can design uh, policies and platforms that can appeal to the uh, to the voters. So simply, we need more uh, economic freedom and also political freedom goes hand to hand. Then we can create prosperity for the future. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, now, Russia. Let's talk a bit about the climate. And uh, the MENA region is among the most vulnerable uh, to climate change globally. What are the expected economic and social implications of climate change in MENA? Um, time of question, uh, given that we just came back from COP28 uh, uh, in Dubai. Um, in fact, much of the region is located in geographically unfavorable climate zones and subject to warming, uh, desertification, water stress, and rising sea levels. So this inevitably leads to fundamental economic disruptions, um, threatens food security because of agricultural disruptions, for, for example, and undermines public health conditions uh, with negative implications on poverty and equality, which we just discussed. The consequences of climate change um, are also expected to increase migration, uh, elevate the risk of conflict in an already turbulent environment within MENA. Um, and in terms of which countries that are going to be affected, which sectors that are going to be affected more, um, the IMF has defined um, resilience to climate change uh, based on a few indicators, including economic growth and macroeconomic stability, uh, socioeconomic strength, infrastructure and investment capabilities, and institutional efficiency. So based on that, as expected, uh, low and and, and middle-income countries and co conflict-affected economies uh, in the region are going to be the most impacted, uh, provided also the absence of fiscal space to finance and promote uh, pro-climate policies. Um, at the same time, um, some oil-exporting uh, MENA economies are also going to be severely affected uh, by changes in climate, uh, I can think of Kuwait, for example, uh, which is the second most affected country in the region uh, in terms of uh, increasing temperatures. And so how can we quantify this in terms of economic loss or gain? So, so far, the research uh, has demonstrated that extreme climate conditions, uh, such as higher temperatures, can significantly alter growth. Um, and in a recent World Bank IMF study, it has been estimated that every MENA country uh, where temperature levels are around 26 degrees or more are going to lose uh, on GDP with every one degree Celsius extra increase in temperature. So this is actually quite alarming. Um, and some sectors are going to be mostly affected um, because they have external exposure uh, with workers uh, going under extreme conditions, and this includes agriculture, uh, construction, and tourism, uh, which are actually vital uh, for many economies in this region, uh, including the middle-income countries, but also many countries of the Gulf. At the same time, I, I, I always like to think of climate change as an opportunity. Um, so if, if we look at the other side of the coin, this risk could also be perceived as a great catalyst for the transition towards a greener economy uh, and region, uh, since the potential for renewable energy generation is also huge. Um, between solar and wind energy, the entire MENA region uh, is expected to be hub for uh, at least 60% of the renewable energy resources worldwide. 
And that's basically why many governments in the region started to implement um, a sort of uh, the energy transition plans, uh, whether in Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, or Morocco, to increase their renewable component and the energy mix over the coming years. And, and investments in the renewable sectors are worth billions. Uh, so I, I honestly like to think of this as a risk, but also a great opportunity for, for the economies of the region. Thank you, Rasha. Uh, next, question, uh, next question goes to you, Mohammed, uh, in the context of Israel-Hamas conflict. Uh, what potential pathways could be pursued to achieve a sustainable resolution to this conflict, ensuring greater stability and prosperity in the region? Well, uh, you know, Hamas must be defeated. This is before any, any further discussion, it must be defeated. But while defeating Hamas, we have to make sure that no civilians being uh, in harm's way. Uh, right now, Egypt is, is, is actively engaged in delivering humanitarian aid. Earlier today, there was an airdrop of uh, humanitarian aid uh, over Gaza. Um, also, on the other hand, involved in the mediation and uh, negotiation to release the uh, innocent uh, hostages that were being abducted by uh, Hamas in the Terror Act of October 7. So, in order to create this stability and prosperity, I believe we need to take some uh, steps. The first step, of course, as I mentioned, is defeating Hamas. Immediate, we have to work on reaching uh, a, a, an immediate and fast uh, cease of uh, hostilities so we can release the, um, the hostages and ensure sufficient aid going to uh, the displaced innocent people there. Adding to that, addressing the influence of uh, Hamas and other Islamic terrorist groups, you know, in the in the um, in this sector and make sure that to cut uh, their influence. And because since they took over the Gaza Strip in 2007, they brought nothing but misery and pain for the Palestinian people and even for the neighboring country. Hamas affiliated fighters have been infiltrated the borders to Sinai and fought with the Islamic terrorist groups uh, during the war on terror in Egypt, you know. so. Uh, they, they, they brought nothing but uh, misery for their own people and for other countries, and they are using them as cannon fodders and uh, human shields. Next to that, empowering the Palestinians to lead a peace process and ensure the solution fair and sustainable and comes from the Palestinians, not any other external forces that uh, impose whatever they, they think. Uh, finally, ensuring uh, access to basic necessities like water, energy, uh, with support of neighboring countries. Egypt and UAE is, is supplying Gaza now with, uh, with portable water via pipelines uh, through our Tarish, uh, where um, an installed desalination factories there. These need to be stabilized, you know, and need to be sustainable, not just a makeshift thing that, like, What's happening now? Let's let's not forget that the problem, one of the problems with Gaza, that they they lack any uh, dependency, uh, sorry, independence when it comes to utilities, water and electricity. And in the beginning of the war, it was cut off, and this make the uh, the human tragedy um, further. Adding to that, post-conflict, we must focus on uh, reconstruction and the economic development. And this approach aims to improve the living conditions of the Palestinians and creating uh, opportunities. And, 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 and this goes through a regional um, partnership, integrating regional partnership. Like, for example, what's happening now when for, 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 for delivering the aid could be a, a foundation to build upon further model, you know, uh, when it comes to reconstruction, to creating opportunities, and we must make sure also to prevent uh, the other uh, forces of evil, for lack of better word, to intervene in this process, because we don't like to re-grow uh, again the, um, the, the, the extremists. Finally, it, we, we need to make a shift in the uh, state of, uh, of Gaza economy. Gaza, for, 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 for decades now, been reliant only on foreign aid and charity, which was stolen by Hamas and other groups, you know, and enriching themselves, you know, and preventing the people. But 
you cannot let two and a half million people just living on charity and aid. There must be a sustainable economic model and uh, creating um, creating prosperity for them and, and, and widening the participation. So if we if we go through these steps, you know, step by step, these five or six steps, I believe that we can create prosperity and we can also achieve the integration in the region. And it would be a very uh, exa a very good example for what peace can achieve, you know, what, pro what, what freedom can do, you know, and achieving prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, in the same context, Rabah, how can we overcome the persistent hindrance to democracy and progress caused by regional conflicts in the region and continue advancing? Thank you, Nina. So, uh, you know, so a bit of uh, context uh, building on what, uh, what just, uh, the senator just mentioned. Uh, the region is indeed uh, uh, one that had a fair share of conflict, uh, no doubt. But before October 7, clearly uh, there was a, a view, including from uh, the Biden administration, that uh, this was a trend of de-escalation. Uh, and indeed, uh, we saw the Abraham Accord uh, normalizing with, uh, uh, from select Arab countries with Israel. We also saw a detent uh, uh, between uh, Iran and, and uh, Saudi Arabia. So all was uh, going well and good until October 7, where we, we had that, uh, that shock. The good news is uh, in that very dark uh, picture is that the Saudi Arabia detent is, uh, is still holding. Uh, but indeed, uh, I second what uh, the senator just mentioned. Uh, we, we need uh, we need to come to uh, this this escalation, uh, uh, which risks engulfing the whole region. Needs to come to an end. We have Ramadan coming. I think this is a, an opportunity to really uh, uh, bring all the forces, uh, uh, you know, good of goodwill, uh, Arab country, uh, uh, the Biden administration, in order to to really rush. Uh, to, to, to get that ceasefire, release the hostages, of course, as well. And uh, I think that's the first step. Uh, the discussion about two-state solution appear from the perspective of the region as a mirage. So discussion of uh, potential two-state solution are, are, are not just uh, premature, but they, they are really not helping uh, deliver the steps, uh, getting that aid through, solving the humanitarian crisis. So, and, and we need, I uh, agree on Hamas, but we also need uh, an Israeli administration uh, that uh, is willing uh, to be a partner in peace. And at the moment, uh, the Netanyahu uh, administration is clearly uh, not committed to, to, to that. So um, I think there's step by step uh, and uh, the ceasefire and the release of the hostage before Ramadan would, would really be a, a, great, uh, um, a, a great first steps. Thank you, Rabah. Uh, I see we have about eight minutes left, so we want to make sure we take some questions from the audience. Uh, there's one for you, Russia. Uh, what, on, what innovative policies can MENA countries implement to dismantle barriers faced by women in accessing economic uh, freedom and opportunities? Uh, sure, thank you, Nina. Uh, so we touched briefly on um, gender inequality, uh, how significant it is in the region. It actually varies between the middle income countries uh, towards the oil exporting countries. So in the oil exporting countries, we're talking about close to 50% uh, participation, uh, which is pretty high. Uh, while in, again, in middle income countries, it actually slows down. So on average, um, based on World Bank data, only 20% of women uh, overall in MENA over the age of 15 are able to participate in the workforce. Um, with these variations, I'm thinking of the leading countries in terms of uh, female participation. Uh, we're thinking of Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, uh, and the UAE. Uh, on the lowest end, there are Algeria, Jordan, Egypt, and Morocco. Uh, so overall, uh, between the two groups, the challenges are more or less the same. Uh, challenges facing women in the labor market uh, include uh, low or mismatched education and skills, um, challenging legal environment in terms of family law, in terms of labor law, um, also provided the absence of uh, labor law protection mechanisms uh, for women, um, absent of support structures uh, for working mothers and expensive childcare services, this is a big barrier. Um, so at some point, women have to choose between family and work. 
absence of support, uh, sorry, an even transition also to the digital economy. Not all women have the same access to technology uh, or to learning technology, and also an even access to finance uh, for women, for female entrepreneurs. Uh, in addition to the persistent uh, socioeconomic skeptical perception of the ability of the abilities and capability of women and the marketplace in general. So fundamentally, enabling women to participate in the workforce starts with institutional and legal reforms to ensure that family law and labor law, they both treat women uh, equally uh, to men and provide equal labor protection rights uh, in, the, in the workplace. Um, in addition to that, improving access to quality education is essential, of course, uh, especially that empirical data actually shows that Women who uh, have been through tertiary education in MENA have a higher participation rate in the labor uh, force than women with intermediary education. Uh, other targeted incentives that could similarly be considered uh, would include, for example, tax-funded maternity leave and subsidized childcare services. Uh, but I think the, the, the starting point is really the legal framework. Um, and I guess, you know, like with multiple efforts uh, now at the grassroots level, there, there is a lot of change that we can see in terms of how the society perceives the role of women and the capabilities uh, in general, including in the Gulf region. Thank you, Rasha. Uh, a question to you, Rabah. Um, how do informal economies affect the overall economic landscape in MENA region, and uh, what policies can be implemented to formalize these sectors? Let, let me push back on the on the informality, uh, um, the depiction of the informality as uh, as necessarily bad. Uh, to, to me, uh, the informal sector in the region is is normal. Is uh, is uh, in 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 many respects is a reaction to the uh, excessive presence of the state and uh, and and potential cronies, and in a sense, the informal sector is the most contestable market. Uh, um, uh, in in uh, in the economy because it has low barrier to entry, a low uh, barrier to exit. So I in a sense, the informal is, is normal and should not be, um, uh, you know, combated if you wish as uh, as necessarily a, a, a bad thing, but rather um, a, a more uh, reflection of what the economy is is truly given the distortion given the. The overwhelming presence of the of the state and and other crony uh, crony firms. So, in many respects, the the rest of the economy has to be more open, uh, and we we've got to remove the barrier to to entry, access to markets for these informal uh, uh, you know enterprise to to grow. And and there uh, there are uh, in addition to to these steps of. Uh, Bringing more freedom uh, to economic freedom and, and removing the barrier, getting getting uh, granting them more access to to market. Of course, there are issues of productivity as well that are essential. Uh, you know, telecom, digital, uh, digitalization uh, is also a very important step for for them to to help them grow. In addition to granting them access to to the market on a fair uh, and equal basis. I believe we have one more time for one question for Mohammed about uh, digital technology, actually. So how can Egypt use digital technologies to boost its economy and create more opportunity for its people? Well, you know, with, with significant number of young Egyptian people, whether uh, in school or in higher education, this is a pivotal, a pivotal moment to leverage digital technologies to transform the future. Uh, digital transformation gives a substantial opportunity for democratization of market access. It helps uh, increasing uh, the market participation, access also to education, financial service, enabling wider uh, segments of the population, especially those who are vulnerable and marginalized, talking about women, for example, and younger people. Uh, adding to that, it, it, it helped in uh, reducing the cost of doing business, and uh, it also helped in, um, when, when it comes you know, to, to formalization, to the formality, what really matters for me is giving those people the opportunity to thrive and to grow. You know, the, 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 the predominant conditions of informality doesn't necessarily always help with that. So with digital transformation can resolve this 
resolve this problem. Also, uh, this will help simplifying and streamlining the, uh, the bureaucratic uh, process. And finally, the beauty of the uh, digitalization, it's much less, uh, I don't like to use um, a harsh word or, or the word, pardon my English, but it's, it's much less deeply or heavily regulated than the regular economy where you have a lot of barriers there. And this gives you uh, a, a better opportunity you know, for, for thriving, and especially for those who live in rural areas or uh, in, 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 in uh, vulnerable uh, situation and against women and uh, younger people. Thank you so much, Thank Muhammad. You. And this actually concludes our panel discussion for today. Thank you so much for the panelists, for your participation and the insights and the great information you shared with us. Thank you for everyone for attending this panel and for everyone who tuned in. Uh, please stay tuned. There's a new, uh, another panel on uh, Africa that's coming up in a few minutes. So please don't go anywhere. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, welcome to the uh, Atlantic Council. I am uh, Ramayad. I am the Senior Director of uh, the Atlantic Council's Africa Center, the Senior Fellow at Europe Center. Um, it's my pleasure, uh, on behalf of the Freedom of and Prosperity Program, to uh, open this, uh, this new panel focused on the paradox of aid forging the path forward in Africa. Um, and today, it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome our three uh, panelists. 
um, William Esterly, uh, who is a professor of economics at New York University and co-director of the NYU Development Research Institute. Um, also, uh, Ray Hartley, uh, who is the research director of the Brent Hurst Foundation. Ray was an anti-apartheid activist in the United uh, Democratic Front and uh, covered the Nelson Mandela presidency, traveling the world with him uh, to testify about his, um, his journey. And Professor Robert Mudida, uh, who is the director of research of uh, the Central Bank of Kenya, and he was also a full uh, professor of political economy at Strathmore University Business School. Uh, he was also a director at the Institute for Public Policy and Governance at SBS. And you have been a visiting professor at uh, numerous universities from Switzerland to Benin, from Nigeria to Spain. Welcome uh, to all of you. The paradox of aid forging the path uh, forward in Africa, that is the tough issue um, we are going to cover today uh, in the next, um, in the next uh, yeah, 35, uh, 40 minutes. So I will start with you, William. Um, aid uh, in Africa does not seem to be very trendy these days or these past years. Um, can you remind us of the level of assistance provided to African countries uh, by their partners, uh, and mostly um, uh, Western partners? And maybe you can say a few words about um, the assistance provided by the competitors, Chinese or Russians, for example. Sure. So I think the, the best way to put aid into perspective is to think about how aid compares to some market-based flows. So for Sub-Saharan Africa, let's think of the aid number on one hand, and then think on the other hand of the combined sum of exports from Africa, remittances from African migrants back to Africa, and foreign direct investment into Africa. So the, the three of those I'm going to call market-based flows, those together amount to six times the amount of aid going into Africa. So there's a way in which a lot of our discussion about aid is paying just too much attention to aid. It's, we're making it more important than it, than it really is for Africa. The most important thing for the growth and dynamism of Africa are these market-based flows, the opportunity to export the freedom of, of trade, somewhat restricted freedom of migrant, the freedom of, to invest in the African continent. These are the sort of most important drivers of Africa's uh, long-run future. The other thing that's very important about aid is the way in which it has sort of been doing the wrong things and going to the wrong places. So after, after around the break point of about 2001 in the new millennium, if you compare aid flows before that point and after that point, the 20 years after that point, the most striking thing about that is that the, the countries that received the most aid were precisely the least free countries. If you rank all the aid recipients of the world into the most free and least free according to sort of widely accepted measures of political and economic freedom, the least free fourth of countries got an aid increase after 2001, up continuing through the 20 year period since then, of 300%. The other three quarters of the countries got an aid increase on the order of 40%. And speaking of annual average aid received by these countries. So it seems like if, aid, if, if we think of economic and political freedom as the key to Africa's development, somehow aid was not going into the support of, of those freer countries adopting those, those freer strategies for long-run prosperity. Why was that? It's probably because aid is very often driven by things that are frankly not about kind of altruism or the the commitment to development success. There are about things that are more to do with US or UK foreign policy, such as after 2001, the obvious thing going on was uh, giving aid to, ally to states that were allies in the war on terror. So for example, Uganda was a, a big aid recipient. Um, Museveni in Uganda was a big ally of the war on terror and helping you know, fight al-Shabaab forces in Somalia and, and uh, cooperating with the war on terror in other, other places. That's a great example. So uh, an autocratic regime that did not allow freedom but was receiving a lot of aid support for probably for mainly those, those reasons. So we have, have this picture that uh, aid uh, is sort of not supporting freedom, but the sort of reassuring thing is uh, the sort of fate of the world does not depend on 
the bumbling efforts of, of aid officials, including myself as a former, former aid official. Uh, the fate of the world is much more in the hands of, of homegrown economic reformers that actually did achieve a lot of great things in Africa, which we can talk about more in the, in the second round. That have, uh, is probably a lot more to do with Africa's uh, long-run future than, than aid, what's going on with aid. Yeah, how, how do you, um, how do you um, explain um, uh, why Africans are more reluctant to aid? Because we know why is the motives uh, from Western countries, partners, but what about Africans? How, how do you assess their willingness to receive this aid? Uh, why aid is less popular uh, now from the African perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think you can understand from what some of us just been talking, what we were just talking about, that uh, aid has this strongly paternalistic flavor that is sort of exaggerating. We, we aid donors are sort of greatly exaggerating our own importance and trying to impose our, our own solutions on, on Africa. Mm -hmm. And that comes across as very, very paternalistic, which of course, you know, intersects with these ridiculous campaigns in the West that were things like, you know, the Do They Know It's Christmas campaigns that went back to the Ethiopian famine of, of the 80s that has been perpetually renewed with a new rock concert every 10 years or so to, for the purpose of supposedly raising awareness about poverty in Africa, but often perpetrating a very insulting, condescending, paternalistic view toward, towards Africa as a, a place full of victim, helpless victims waiting for Western mm -hmm. rescue. You know, that's this sort of appalling you know, that's not the viewpoint inside the more serious aid community, but that's sort of the, the message that goes out there into the Western public that is so important to raise support for aid, but unfortunately also raises support for very ill-designed ill uh, military interventions by the West into Africa and in general sort of paternalistic dictates to Africa that understandably a lot of Africans uh, protest against that sort of pa paternalistic mm. condescension. You know, the, the famous phrase of the Nigerian writer Teju Cole about the white savior industrial complex, you know, that sort of puts it all into that. And there is this African proverb that says, uh, the hands that gives is always uh, um, 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 uh, behind the, the, the hand that receives, you know? Yes, So yes. this is uh, exactly this. Uh, um, Professor uh, Robert Mudida, you have uh, an important experience, a big, an important experience in Africa from Kenya to, to Nigeria. So you know from the ground how aid is, is, uh, is received. So can you, can you just um, tell us um, more about the way uh, or how you assess the outcomes of the policy of the aid policy to African countries, is it uh, compatible with uh, freedom and prosperity uh, for Africans? And what um, um, what does it look like of an, effic an efficient financial assistance to Africans? Okay, thanks a lot for that question, and thanks a lot for having me. I think um, the subject of aid is a complex one, mm -hmm. so. Um, just to start off, I would say that, that uh, aid can certainly not solve all of Africa's problems because Africa's problems are multifaceted. It, it works better in certain circumstances, and I would say it's worked better in countries where you've had uh, more inclusive institutions in, in, in the context of, of uh, this particular conference. I think where you've had uh, more inclusive political and economic institutions, then you find aid has had more of an impact. In countries that have been less economically and politically free, then you find also aid uh, probably hasn't uh, had as much impact as it could have. So I think the question of, of uh, freedom is a very central one and, and definitely impacts aid considerably. Mm -hmm. Where you have better institutions, then aid has tended to work better. Mm -hmm. So you'd need to go to, to country experiences to be able to see that uh, and, and to see where it's had more of an impact, less of an impact. But I think the institutional variable is, is very critical. And what about the, because it's very, it can be, it, people may think that it's very simple to consider it as a whole. Um, maybe if we dive into the details, uh, we can have um, a different assessment. Uh, how do you appreciate uh, grants, loans, for example? Uh, is it the same kind of aid 
or is it different in terms of efficiency? Mm -hmm. and, and, and secondly, um, uh, AIDS is everywhere, you know, um, climate change, water, education, uh, health. What sector uh, should be uh, prioritized or where the, the needs are the most pressing, according to you? Yeah, okay, thanks a lot for that question. I think again, it's. I, I think again, it, it it depends on 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 two critical things. Mm -hmm. One is, of course, the amount of aid, and how it's helping to to fill critical gaps in African economies. Because what aid does, aid helps to fill uh, the gap between savings and investment. And if you look at many African countries, for example, the average savings rate as a percentage of GDP is about 11 percent. And yet they need, you know, to, uh, to have sustainable long-term growth. You need about 25 to 30 percent of GDP. You need to be able to generate that kind of investment for it to be sustainable. So I think it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's very critical uh, to look at the gaps being filled in many African countries as well. At the moment, they are struggling in, in, in a fiscal sense. Mm -hmm. You find as well, uh, uh, let's say, revenues that are raised. Uh, again, uh, you know, would be about 17% of GDP. You need about close to 30% of GDP if you compare by the standards of other emerging markets to be able to do sufficient things. And then very importantly also is, is uh, the conditionalities attached mm -hmm. to this aid as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think that's a very crucial component. To, so when you're talking of loans, uh, loans are helpful in the sense that they probably make you more accountable because you know you have to repay them. Mm -hmm. But also that increases indebtedness. But also there has to be some flexibility, as, as Bill was saying, to be able to come up with homegrown solutions. So how much flexibility do the loans allow you as well to come up with enduring solutions for the problems that you face? Mm -hmm. Grants are attractive, of course, mm -hmm. uh, because of the highly concessional nature. Mm -hmm. But the problem is then you can become too dependent on them. And then you might not address root causes of some of the problems. Mm -hmm. So I think ultimately what's important, beyond the question of whether they are loans and grants, is whether the aid is helping to create an environment for, uh, you know, for uh, long-term development. Mm -hmm. I think we need to move beyond aid. For example, in Africa's uh, case, it's, it's very central for many countries to reorient towards, for example, more trade, more trade rather than just aid, because aid creates a certain dependence. So more trade opportunities. So, uh, for example, in, in recent years, we've launched the African Continental Free Trade Area. And I think potentially, if, if, if that works well, then that can create tremendous opportunities in critical sectors in Africa, like manufacturing and services. Mm -hmm. That is important on the one hand. I think on the other hand, also, what's very important is that we're, we're innovating more, that we're enhancing productivity. Because if you look at struggles in many of Africa's sectors, they have to do with issues of innovation. Mm -hmm. So if aid helps, in a sense, to be able to, to enhance innovation in different ways, then I think it's useful. If it's not helping to, uh, African countries to innovate more, to become more productive, then it can become a drawback. Mm -hmm. There are certain types of aid, even beyond loans and grants, there are certain types of aid that I think generally are very helpful and these are the ones that focus on capacity building, provided they are properly tailored. So you find World Bank and IMF programs, for example, often uh, beyond the traditional components have a capacity building component. Mm -hmm. And that capacity building component often centers on innovation and productivity. Mm -hmm. And so that is very central. Yeah, we'll come back to um, to, to more um, of, of that uh, later. If you allow me uh, to give the mic to Ray and um, ask about um, the 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 way we link a financial assistance and the uh, democratic nature of regimes or not, because uh, the question is: Should Western financial assistance to African countries be linked, or any country, be linked to political support, uh, to democratic values, for example. Um, because uh, this is something that is in 
every mouth um, in policymakers, uh, in, in Western policymakers' uh, mouths. But in the meantime, we uh, cannot ignore the trade off that exists between providing assistance, security, and aid to regimes that do not have a great democratic practice. So, um, how, in, in the interest of stability, how do, you, um, how do you appreciate that? What is your opinion about this trade off between uh, aid and, um, I don't know, politics? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it absolutely is linked whether, whether or not you would like it to be linked. So, for example, the environment into which you pour a vast amount of money determines very much how that money ends up being used in, in that society. And in closed authoritarian societies, the outcome is, is, is likely to be far less effective mm. than an open, accountable, democratic society where there'd be checks and balances. And if there was corruption, there might be prosecutions. There might be legal recourse for the for the donor and for the, the beneficiaries who are not benefiting uh, might be able to take up, take up the, the, the case. In, in these closed societies, pouring the money in often is really just handing it over for redistribution by the, the, the authoritarian government. And they would then use that to extend their patronage network. Uh, and very often the beneficiaries on the ground are not necessarily those who are in the best position or best able to use that money, but are politically connected and end up uh, really just abusing those funds to some extent. Not in all cases. I think there are aid agencies that have strategies to, to counteract that, where they have very strong relationships directly with the recipients, and they then monitor very closely how that, uh, how that is working and take action if they see there's there's a problem or else withdraw. Mm -hmm. But I do think there is, I think it's usually approached from the point of view of you need to encourage democratic practices by rewarding mm -hmm. governments that are democratic. I think that, that there is a case for that. Mm -hmm. But more than that, uh, simply because you need the outcomes to be maximized. Mm -hmm. So how much of this flow of, of resources is actually going into something real on the ground. Um, you have a great experience uh, from South Africa. Um, from a South African point of view, how do you appreciate the paradox of aid? Yeah, I think that uh, in the South African environment, I think if there are some very interesting cases. Mm -hmm. I think one of the uh, most successful aid interventions that's been made was PEPFAR which was the uh, US government's um, uh, uh, aid to assist with fighting HIV AIDS in South Africa. And you know, the metric there is very clear. You just need to look at South Africa's life expectancy graph. Mm -hmm. And you can literally see the change from the moment that this aid arrived and the upward swing. Mm -hmm. But I think that money was put into an environment where there was a lot of accountability um, a lot of public debate and discussion, including in Parliament, uh, about how this money would be used. And it was a society where uh, you had a very uh, vibrant and active civil society that was in fact engaged with this issue and it applied a great deal of political pressure onto the government to deal with this uh, um, HIV AIDS problem. Um, that was then vigilant and able to watch and ensure that those resources went to very effective outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a targeted uh, uh, aid intervention made in a society where there is a, a vibrant, uh, independent civil society that's able to monitor it um, and where you have clear metrics that show you the outcome mm -hmm. working. So in that environment, I think you... And yet, uh, South Africa is, uh, this very South Africa is a paradox uh, by itself because uh, if we compare that experience with AIDS and the, the, the good outcomes then, and a, a few years and months ago with COVID, South Africa uh, stood up uh, to, uh, to question the Western aid when it comes to... Um, uh, medicines and vaccines, uh, you know, against the COVID. Um, 
how, how do you explain uh, that um, South Africa did not want to build from the past success successes on AIDS and decided just to uh, um, to deny any efficiency to the Western AIDS when it comes to the COVID, for example, COVID policies? Yeah. I think the danger is I'm, I'm going to get into a discussion on foreign policy um, <laughs> because I think that yeah. there's, there have been a lot of developments yeah. in South Africa regarding its global positioning and its posture towards the West mm -hmm. um, and a growing populism that, that has crept into establishment politics mm -hmm. and uh, that very much was part of it. So with COVID, you know, this kind of um, reflexive, uh, anti-Western uh, view that, that, that took hold. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there were some possibly legitimate questions that were being asked mm -hmm. about why don't we enable some productive capacity in South Africa and elsewhere. Uh, you know, South Africa is well capable of producing vaccines, mm -hmm. not necessarily with the IP to um, develop them, but certainly once developed to roll out the production, we have some very sophisticated pharmaceutical operations in the country, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But those are, are more nuanced questions. I think, generally speaking, it relates more to the sort of drift that the uh, ruling party in South Africa has away from the West and towards uh, the sort of BRICS uh, alignment mm -hmm. and especially with Russia and China. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and even Iran lately. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Bill, we understand that aid is not an innocent thing. Uh, it's uh, strongly linked to uh, uh, foreign policy. Um, and I would like to ask you about uh, the state of uh, the neoliberal um, economic reforms um, in Africa, because um, we know that the Bretton Woods institutions, for example, from the World Bank to IMF, has linked um, the support, the financial support to economic and structural reforms in Africa. Um, is it still the case uh, or has something, has anything changed uh, about the Washington consensus? Yeah, so I'm not always sure what neoliberalism means exactly. <laughs> it's something like, uh, maybe something like liber liberalism with a dose of coercion applied. <laughs> uh, so uh, the bad part of, of the Washington consensus was that it was a Washington consensus, that it seemed to be imposed from Washington through World Bank and IMF conditionality. And that, I think, actually delayed the ad, uh, onset of economic pro-market economic reforms in Africa because of the backlash against that, that, against that coercion. Uh, but what actually happened was that I think that there emerged a kind of homegrown consensus Towards, towards economic reform. Let me give you a, one specific example. When I first joined the World Bank in 1985, my first trip was to go to Ghana. At that time, Ghana was just recovering from a disastrous period in which uh, inflation had been in the triple digits. The, there were severe controls on all aspects of the economy. If you looked at, at many objective measures, Ghana was as tightly controlled as an Eastern European Soviet-style e economy. And the, you know, the black market premium on foreign exchange was above 2,000%. The cocoa exporters that had been the lifeblood of the economy were getting something like 6% of the world price for cocoa, and cocoa had, was dying and had almost died in, in Ghana. And then what happened was not so much the imposition of anything from Washington, but Jerry Rawlings in Ghana, who had been a proponent of extreme controls, he decided with some other advisors that this was disastrous and something better had to happen. He started moving towards economic reforms. And you know that was sort of the beginning of what later emerged as a more democratic consensus in, in Ghana after it transitioned to democratic rule. And we started getting the input of great Ghanaian economists like my colleague Yao and Yarko at, at NYU. And so it's more, it emerged as more of a homegrown process a, a way, a, a sort of reaction against the extreme controls that had been so disastrous, these kind of controls like I just described in Ghana. And in fact, that was very precisely timed to the revival of the Ghanaian economy. Ever, ever, that was the turning point uh, with, with those reforms in the 80s was the turning point 
that changed the whole picture from negative growth in Ghana to steady positive growth ever since then. And I think that's the larger story of, of Africa. And I think, you know, in contrast with some of the gloom and doom, understandable gloom and doom that we all feel about today's situation, I think this is a much happier long run trend the movement towards more economic freedom in Africa and some movement towards more political freedom in, in Africa. And that is, in a way, as momentous as the fall of the Berlin Wall was and the end of Soviet communism. It's like the, the end of development planning and the end of extreme con state controls to promote development, which was being pushed by the development community before the, before the mid-1980s also. So the, the sort of the whole mindset of development sort of shifted from this sort of planning state state intervention kind of model to a much more freer model that I think also was very much demanded by, by everyday, everyday citizens. So that's, that's sort of the happier story about, about neoliberalism. You know, if I think of an example of uh, elsewhere in the African continent, uh, the, the famous event of the street vendor in Tunisia, Mohamed Bouaziz, who set himself on fire in protest against a policewoman confiscating his fruit and his scales and slapping him in the face. And later, his, uh, after his death, his mother said, you know, he was just, his, his sense of dignity had been violated. And that, that was what led to his outrage and his protest. And his brother later said, you know, what his example shows is the poor also want the right to buy and sell. They simply want the right to buy and sell. Mm -hmm. That they want that elementary dignity of being able to participate in markets. So I think it's a mistake to think of market reforms as something imposed from outside. I think it's something that is very much an indigenous, reflecting indigenous demands for greater, greater freedom, both in the economic sphere and in the political sphere. Um, what do you think? Because we have mentioned the experience you have from the World Bank and um, the, the role of the institutions in the Washington consensus. Um, what do you think about the aid provided by the NGOs, um, meaning uh, humanitarian assistance um, in hotspots, um, areas of crisis in Africa, um, like Eastern DRC, for example? This kind of assistance, is it the right answer um, to provide to situations of, of strong crisis like this. We, we, we heard these past years how NGOs have been questioned uh, their presence in some of these areas. How, how do you um, assess the situation? You know, um, I think this, this is also very related to the dignity theme of aid. Does aid really respect dignity or not? And certainly refugee camp situations with humanitarian aid are, are a big case of that. You know, the great, uh, Ugandan uh, historian and public intellectual Mahmoud Mamdani um, has written about his own experience in a refugee camp when he was uh, as a refugee from uh, Idi Amin's Uganda when uh, Amin confiscated the, the property of, of East Indians in, Uga in Uganda. He himself was a refugee and he wrote really memorably about his own experience, which is a voice we sel very seldom get to hear. So it was really valuable that Mahmoud Mamdani could reflect. And he's himself commenting on the, the dignity of refugees. So he said, you know, they took from us everything, but, you know, the one thing we were never going to give up was our self-respect. You know, when the refugee camp was telling them with 24, with 12 hours notice, we're going to move you from this camp to that camp, and they he protested and organized the resistance, you know, that we have the right to be notified to, in a timely manner before we're transferred. It's such a tiny thing about that that we'd never even get a, a moment's notice in designing refugee aid. You know, that's the kind of thing that I think we too often aid officials forget, that aid is not only about material poverty and material suffering in the midst of a refugee situation, it's also about dignity. And his ability to kind of voice, voice the need for dignity and aid is sort of the kind of thing that really inspires me about the, the future. The mm -hmm. future. Not, not, aid does not inspire that kind of hope, but uh, the, the homegrown efforts to protest for greater dignity, whether it be Mahmoud Mamdani or um, Mohamed Bouaziz in Tunisia, you know, lighting the spark that, that led to the Arab Spring, you know, that's the kind of inspirational, homegrown demand for freedom that I get inspired by. 
And, and precisely, uh, uh, from individuals uh, to our states and policies are uh, on, on the line in Africa. And uh, I remember a few months ago when, Bur when France decided to suspend its aid to Burkina Faso. Um, and the, the junta, the military leader said, we don't care. I mean, we can do without you. We can cope with the situation because your aid has not been very efficient uh, to our countries for, for decades now. So aid used as a tool for sovereignty um, from in, in the Sahel uh, now. Uh, we also remember uh, when in Sudan, um, the Prime Minister Hamdok has been uh, removed from the power by the military too. And the military said, um, these structural reforms, they are, um, even if we have some aid and assistance from uh, IMF or World Bank, the cost uh, for the people is too high. That was the excuse the military found to remove Hamdok from the power. So how do you, uh, what is your opinion about uh, these statements coming from uh, these uh, countries um, questioning um, aid as a tool uh, as an anti-tool for sovereignty of these nations? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. I think there's always a concern, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's been there for decades, about, about how much uh, the conditions, especially if the conditions are very pervasive, very mm -hmm. restrictive, how much they impact national sovereignty. So that's, that's, that's a concern that's been there for a long time, and often it's valid. Uh, you know, so so they they has to be, I mean, in an ideal situation, there has to be negotiation of the terms to to the degree possible, so that so that key aspects that are central to to the development agenda of countries are taken into account. Mm -hmm. So that concern can be there, and sometimes there's uh, sovereignty is affected when there's a lot of imposition of conditionalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but at the same time, also one has to be careful because also uh, sovereignty issues can become an excuse. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it can become an excuse for imposing autocratic rule. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, autocratic regimes sometimes can can invoke sovereignty arguments to say that that uh, well, uh, you know, uh, our sovereignty is being is being infringed, and so now we necessitate sort of cutting links. Whereas sometimes the issue is that their management of, of state affairs is being questioned mm -hmm. by some of the countries, for example, with with uh, with which they have uh, uh, bilateral relations. So I think you need a balance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when 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 you're looking at that. But uh, ultimately, the, what's central, and, 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 and I think I emphasized this before, is that uh, aid has to be able to support long-term development outcomes. In some of the countries you mentioned, for example, a big challenge is that, is that um, there are typical examples of where you have uh, you know, insecurity, uh, probably arising from, from uh, the fact that development outcomes are not properly met. And then, and then that insecurity itself tends to worsen the, the, the uh, development outcome. So you have a mutually reinforcing negative cycle. So I think, I think it's very important to realize there's a nexus between security and development. And so you want to promote development outcomes, particularly the ones related to, to human capital development, health and education. I think those are very central for dignity, mm -hmm. but also for for long-term productivity and 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 for long-term innovation. Mm -hmm. So I think those have to be upheld. So if the regime is just simply critical, uh, uh, you know, based on on on, let's say sovereignty arguments, but at the same time is not able to provide, you know, critical levels of education, health. Uh, you know, then that makes the argument sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes less valid. So I think one has to analyze that, that um, yeah. uh, carefully. This is not the only paradox uh, when it comes to aid, and uh, I, I would like um, to um, to continue uh, this idea with you, Ray, by asking you a question about uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, this is a paradox because I, I remember um, a few months ago when we mentioned um, Western support to Africa. Um, Ukraine was everywhere, and it seems that 
uh, for the NGOs Ukraine. The, the Western assistance for Ukraine disrupted the financial commitments um, from the West to African countries. Uh, it's also a paradox because on, on one hand, we don't want that aid anymore, but on the other hand, when Ukraine is there, it's, it's, uh, it's less for African countries. So um, is it the problem or uh, do West, Westerns should make a choice between Africa and Ukraine? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, for Africa, just uh, to, to generalize, I mean, I think that the, there is a, you know, the world is very distracted. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of other crises. There are a lot of other looming crises. Yeah, or Gaza or, um, yeah. And, and Africa is not top of mind in the way that it, it once was when it comes to, to aid. So, you know, there's a message in that, which, I mean, I think Africa, Africans have to actually start looking beyond aid and looking at, at doing things which, which have started to happen. For example, the Africa Free Trade uh, Agreement and so on. But I, I do think there is still the question of where does, where's the investment going to come that's going to enable these, not just the, the, the social development, but the economic development. So, for example, African Free Trade Area um, is often seen as, well, you know, uh, there are internal markets for African goods, which I think is part of it. But there's also a supply chain side to that. There's an enormous potential now to have the scale uh, to build continent-wide um, value chains, which might boost exports and start dealing with this problem that, that Africa has had in developing its productive sector to a point where it can start earning serious foreign exchange, exporting and start man, you know, manufacturing and reindustrializing or industrializing. So that, that potential is there, but the problem is that the, the capital needed for that, whether it's aid, grants, um, or investment, is increasingly in short supply because of the demands of these other theaters. Uh, and it's, 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 it's a real problem because the opportunity is now better than ever. I think I agree with. Uh, what what Prof is saying that there is on the ground a much more open uh, and a readiness to actually start looking at this question of uh, economic development, economic growth um, on the continent, but the resources to empower this are scarce. Um, thank you. I think we are uh, we we reach we are reaching the end of this conversation. Uh, very very. Uh, Exciting conversation. Thank you. Um, thank you, William. Thank you, Ray and, uh, and Robert, uh, for uh, your, um, your thoughts on this, uh, not one paradox of it, but obviously uh, many paradoxes. Uh, we understand that Africa needs to see beyond it and is looking beyond it uh, through uh, industrial transformation, um, new projects like the AFTA, even the transfers from, from immigrants, you know, uh, but also dignity, right? So on that, with that, uh, I would like to thank you again and um, over to the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. We all want prosperity for families, communities, countries, and for the world. We want people to not only have food and shelter, but a good standard of living, education, health care, a fair society, and a clean environment. That's what we mean by prosperity. But what is the surest path to prosperity? Academics, policymakers, and citizens have been debating this matter for a very long time. Some say that free societies produce the best outcomes by unleashing the creativity and talent of individual citizens. Others say that focusing on the individual is too chaotic and ultimately inefficient, that a strong central authority produces the best results. The Freedom and Prosperity Center at the Atlantic Council, a think tank in Washington, D.C., contributes facts and figures to this debate through our annual Freedom and Prosperity Indexes. We built a Freedom Index to measure economic, political, and legal freedom in 164 countries. Each score reflects measurements of several indicators. 
Together, they create a comprehensive and unique measurement of freedom. We also built a prosperity index to measure income, health, education, the environment, treatment of minorities, and inequality in the same 164 countries. A prosperous society should be judged on more than just income per capita. Our index gives us a holistic view of prosperity. In the Freedom Index, we rank countries into four tiers based on their total scores, free, mostly free, mostly unfree, and unfree. In the Prosperity Index, we rank countries as prosperous, mostly prosperous, mostly unprosperous, and unprosperous. We have three key takeaways from the resulting data. Our first takeaway is that there is a strong correlation between our freedom and prosperity scores. We show a 0.8 correlation between a country's scores in the two indexes. This means high values for freedom are associated with high values for prosperity, and low values for freedom are associated with low values for prosperity. On average, the freer the country, the higher it will score in all six measures of prosperity. The income scores show that free countries are far and away the richest. People born in free countries are also healthier and live substantially longer. Citizens of freer countries have access to better education and spend more time learning. The environment scores indicate that freer countries have cleaner environments. Unfree societies are less equal. Wealth is more unevenly distributed among citizens. And unsurprisingly, unfree countries are also less tolerant. This leads to our second takeaway. Evidence suggests that freedom contributes to prosperity. We examined for our sample of 164 countries the correlation between changes in freedom and changes in prosperity over time. If freedom is really driving prosperity, an improvement in freedom would be strongly associated with an improvement in prosperity. And that is exactly what we find. Countries that increased their freedoms the most are the ones where prosperity increased the most. Peru and Venezuela are prime examples. In 1995, Venezuela was a freer country than Peru. But at the turn of the century, Peru made a clear turn towards freedom. It is one of the top improvers in our data. In contrast, Venezuela shows the largest decrease in freedom of all the countries we cover. Venezuela had a higher prosperity score than Peru in 1995, but by 2022, the two countries had switched positions. Our third takeaway is that autocracies generally fail to deliver prosperity for their people while free countries succeed. Of the 30 countries ranked at the top of our freedom rankings, 27 are in the top category of our prosperity index, and three are in the next highest category. None are in the bottom two categories of prosperity. Of the 30 countries ranked at the bottom of our freedom index, 11 are in the lowest category of our prosperity index, 17 are in the next lowest category, and just two in the mostly prosperous category. None are in the top prosperity category. Our indexes demonstrate that there is a strong relationship between freedom and prosperity. And we have reason to believe that improvements in freedom will, over time, lead to greater and more durable prosperity. Please visit the website for the Atlantic Council's Freedom and Prosperity Indexes. The interactive capabilities of the website allow you to compare detailed data across time for countries and regions. All our indexes, information, and our annual report can be downloaded for further analysis.
Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our panel on institutional retrenchment growth in Latin America. Today, we're privileged to host two exceptionally accomplished experts in the field. Let me introduce them to you. First, we have Vanessa Marquez Rubio, Rubio Marquez, sorry, a distinguished public servant in Mexico's government with a 25-year career in various high-ranking positions in public service. Notably, she has made history as the first woman to serve as a Deputy Minister of Finance, in addition to her social and development foreign and affairs roles in Latin America and the Caribbean. Her expertise has been pivotal in the USMCA and the Pacific Alliance. Currently based in London, Vanessa holds a prestigious position as a professor and associate dean at the School of Public Policy at the London School of Economics, associate fellow at the Chatham House, and senior advisor, advisor to uh, McCl uh, McClarty Associates, where she shares her vast experience and continues to influence global policy discussions. Joining her is uh, Jason Marsak, a renowned Latin America policy and development leader, serving as the Atlantic Council Senior Director of the Adrian Arch Latin America Center. Jason's career is distinguished by his role as an adjunct professor at George Washington University Elliott School of International Affairs, where he shares his expertise on Central America and immigration policy. His background includes positions in the America Society Council of the Americas, America's Quarterly Magazine, um, Partners of the America, contributing significantly to civil society engagement and policy development. A respected both, both in English and Spanish media, Jason has engaged with the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relationships and the U.S. House Committee on Foreign Affairs. He has presented his work on Caribbean leaders. Myself, I'm Julio, and I will be moderating this panel. Jason, could you provide us an analysis of the current state of uh, institutional integrity in Latin America and its implications for, for growth? Well, thank you so much, Julio and Vanessa. Wonderful to be with you on the panel, and congratulations to Dan Negrea and the whole Freedom and Prosperity Center for this really excellent, uh, excellent conference. Um, uh, really important to have these conversations and, and to do so uh, on, on an annual basis. Uh, actually, just yesterday, uh, in this chair was uh, Juan Gonzalez, who's the NSC Senior Director for Western Hemisphere, because we were launching a report uh, yesterday, Atlanta Council report, on redefining a new U.S. partnership strategy with Latin America and the Caribbean, a result of about a year's worth of work to try to meet the region where it is, right, and to try to find those points of synergy, specifically going to your question, Julia, because of the concern about institutional retrenchment and because of the, the, the need for the U.S. to redefine some of the tools in our toolbox to make, our, make the U.S. an even stronger partner with the region given the, the challenge that we're seeing. Are we seeing retrenchment? I'm going to give you a, a yes and no answer. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think that, I think, what, and I'll, Vanessa will talk in more in depth in, in Mexico, so I'll leave that to, to her. There's a couple. So on, on the on where are we seeing where are we seeing those those real challenges to institutions? Um, well, you know, I think um, of course uh, Nicaragua comes to mind. Uh, Nicaragua comes to mind because of uh, Daniel Ortega abolishing presidential term limits, uh, presidential candidates that are no longer able to run. Those in the op those those who are in the opposition have are, are either um, uh, quiet or have been forced to flee the country in order to survive. Uh, student activists, civil society, those voices have, have all. Been been uh, uh, diminished, have been muted because of the threats in, in, in Nicaragua. Um, of course, similar Venezuela as well. Uh, the Venezuelan institutions have been absolutely decimated. And I, and I think uh, decimated might even be a, a, a light word uh, since Hugo Chavez first came to power over 20 years ago and then, and then Nicolas Maduro uh, took over uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, we see that right now. We see that there was a, a the Barbados Agreement uh, struck uh, last, uh, last fall uh, where Maduro promised for relief of sanctions to be able to allow for uh, some type of, of degree of, of elections. The top opposition candidate, the one who's Maria Corina Machado, Coincidentally, we hosted her yesterday as well at the Atlantic Council, uh, and she came here to the, uh, via video at the Atlantic Council to speak about the, you know, the continued threats to her own candidacy and the fact that Nicolas Maduro will not allow her uh, to run as the opposition candidate, despite the fact that he had agreed at the, this Barbados agreement for uh, uh, allowing for uh, some semblance of, uh, of, of fair elections. Uh, so Venezuela, uh, political voices, political prisoners, uh, UN agency recently kicked out of the country. Uh, and so we, we see, uh, we can talk about Cuba as well, and that's, that could be a whole, uh, whole other uh, aspect of our, of our conversation. But, but I, I also, you know, I think that there's um, a couple other areas to highlight. One is 
uh, Guatemala. I was just in Guatemala two weeks ago. Uh, we did a uh, Atlanta Council event with the uh, new president, uh, Bernardo Revolo, his vice president, and a number of his ministers. Uh, that was a real concern. His getting to power was a real concern. Part of the challenge in Guatemala is you have such a long period of presidential transition. He was elected in August, took office in January, and uh, being an outside candidate, the forces, uh, uh, the entrenched, many of the entrenched forces did not want to see him come to power. And there were many that tried to prevent him from coming to power, including the actual day of his inauguration. Uh, the Congress, it, it was, the vote was, I think, delayed about, about 10 hours in Congress before he, he actually assumed uh, office. Uh, a lot of um, work behind the scenes to make sure that he was actually able to assume power. So important from the Atlanta Council that we came in quickly within a month of his uh, presidency to really show that support from an international institution. So Guatemala is actually a case in the hemisphere where democracy and institutions work. Now they were threatened, tremendously threatened throughout the transition and there are continued threats to the, to the president, but they, they panned out. Um, I'll, I'll also just mention Brazil. Uh, we, uh, uh, former President Bolsonaro had a huge rally in Sao Paulo on, on Sunday. Uh, um, you know, he, he uh, of course, we have January 6th here. Uh, there's January 8th uh, in, in Brazil where President Bolsonaro's, uh, uh, many of his, uh, those close to him tried to uh, uh, um, subvert power uh, with um, uh, many, many acts in, 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 uh, in Brasilia against government institutions. What we saw in Brazil was, was that we saw the ability of the Brazilian institutions to remain strong. And, uh, and, and prevent Bolsonaro from uh, trying to uh, uh, remain, remain in power. And those institutions continue to be strong uh, as uh, new cases are put forth against Bolsonaro and you see the strength of the Brazilian judiciary. So in some, Julio, there, there is uh, many challenges to institutions across the region and institutions are continuing to be tested However, there are a few cases recently where I can point to the result, and I could go country by country, but I, I want to give Vanessa a chance here. Uh, but where, where, where you can show the, the, the resilience of institutions when those institutions are strong to be able to prevent those who are seeking to subvert them from overthrowing. The last point we need to think about when thinking about the strength of institutions is the real, real challenge of um, money coming in from uh, um, uh, transnational criminal organizations. Uh, TCOs are one of the biggest threats to democracy and, to, and to institutions across the hemisphere. We, we see that in Ecuador. Uh, we see that in, in Guatemala. Uh, uh, criminal organizations were literally trying to pay members of Congress to vote against uh, uh, President Revolo from t taking office. Um, and so that, that is the, 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 the narco politics is going to be one of the grow is already a threat and will continue to be a growing threat across the region. Thank you very much, Jason. Vanessa, and building on Jason's overview and you know, taking into consideration that there are uh, elections in Mexico this year, how would you uh, position Mexico in this context? Thank you so much, Julio. It's a pleasure to be here and to share panels with my friend Jason. Thank you, Dan. And uh, of course, thank you to Joseph and to all the team here at, at the Atlantic Council and the Freedom and Prosperity Center, of which I am a proud member of the Advisory Council. So happy to be here. Yes, uh, and I tend to uh, um, agree with uh, much of what Jason just mentioned. Uh, let me just mention something in relation to, to the index and how it has played out in, in relation to Mexico the, uh, lately and, and this year in, in the new atlas. No? So Mexico is considered to be a mostly free and a mostly prosperous, no? so, so trapped in a somehow middle, uh, not being able to uh, improve both, both elements of freedom and prosperity. It dropped five places since uh, 2018. Uh, it's below now uh, Latin America's average. And um, the most acute falls you can track to um, the, the falls in the legal and political freedoms. So I'm going to try to explain a series of, of nuances and, and specificities around uh, the Mexico's context, which I think is important. Mexico has a, um, administrations of six years. So presidents stay in power for six years. We don't have a re-election whatsoever. And having said this, uh, there was a regime change in Mexico in 2018. And this is something that we need to understand. Why do I say there was a regime change? 
because there was a redefinition of the state within itself. There was a redefinition of the relationship between the state and the market. And there was a redefinition uh, of the relationship between the state and the society. So the, the state within itself was redefined because now there's a new correlation between the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary with much more intervention of the executive on the legislative, particularly the opposition, with much more intervention of the executive in the judiciary, particularly the Supreme Court of Justice, but not solely. And also the, the rethinking around uh, the philosophy of the government. Uh, and in this regard, there has been a, quite a, a challenge to science-based approach, the technocratic approach that was discussed in, in, in other latitudes. And there has been a more binary a, a sort of understanding of the state and the society, one in which a polarization and populism play a, a large role, and one in which um, there, there has a, a certain uh, flavor of canceling pluralism. So there's el pueblo, the people as a whole, no, without any nuance, without any specificities, and me that governs the country. No? So that I idea of, 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 of how, how populism is understood in the world and how this has become an authoritarian trend. When I wrote the, the piece for, for this uh, year's publication, uh, we didn't have by then a, a proposal that was set forth by the president just early this month uh, with 20 constitutional reforms. And the 20 constitutional reforms include, for instance, getting rid of independent and technical institutions no? that took Mexico 40 years to build. Uh, and these are the uh, Electoral Institute in the one hand that ensures free and fair elections, but also uh, the, you know, the technical regulating bodies of the several sectors of the economy, but also the Competition Institute uh, that guarantees competition, but also the uh, institute that regulates uh, data and privacy. No? So, so uh, this is something that is happening in, in the country. But one, I think, should ask, ask questions such as, why is this happening? Why was this uh, something that was a, 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 you know, a reality in Mexico since 2018 until now? And there's a lot of reflection we need to do also, no? to look ourselves at the mirror and say, what failed? No? Uh, uh, this morning, we, we were listening to, to Asemoglu's uh, presentation on, on um, democratic retrenchment and the correlation between institutions, democracy, and, and, and free trade, and economic growth, and prosperity. And there's a lot I think we need to analyze there. No? Uh, the institutions were there, but how well the institutions were performing, perhaps, is something that we should ask ourselves. And also, uh, Kelly, this morning in another panel, was mentioning uh, how we haven't been able to be uh, successful in conveying the message around what is democracy? What should we expect around democracy? No? And uh, what exactly would we find in the absence of democracy? Sometimes in the younger generations, they haven't seen the counterfactual. They haven't experienced what is to live uh, under not democratic institutions, under not free trade, under not uh, uh, you know, the, the respect of freedom and, 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 and institutions as a whole. So I think there's a lot of work we need to do there also in sort of self-analysis uh, in order to understand how we can build the foundations of what lies in the future, because of course there's a future, and of course uh, we need to uh, move uh, towards a better stance in relation to um, democracy, in relation to sound and functioning institutions that give answers to the society. I think that's the problem now. The lack of connection, uh, the lack of trust, no? There's some data from the Latino Barometro uh, 2024 that I find uh, uh, striking, no? In, in the case of Mexico, this is 2024 Latino Barometro. When you ask uh, the question of whether democracy is preferable to any other form of government, 35% of Mexicans say yes. No? When you ask, in some circumstances, an authoritarian government can be better than a democratic one, 33% of Mexicans say yes. When you ask, for people like us, democratic or a non-democratic regime is the same, 27% answer yes. So, so 
we need to listen more. We need to understand better. We need to engage in this polarized world. We need to understand the otherness, and we need to find answers as to how to construct the future we all want uh, in relation to freedom and prosperity. So I, I'll leave my, my first comment here. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. So I think that there's a general trend on these cycles w between, you know, like uh, technocratism and then populism. And especially, this is very pronounced in Latin America. In the 90s, we had this growth of uh, the technocratic wing where, you know, like globalization was spread throughout the continent. And as Vanessa was mentioning, you know, like this, uh, this people were very disenchanted with this mm -hmm. trend. Uh, Jason, I would like to understand a bit better, what are the root causes of this disenchantment? What are the broader consequences that it has brought? And what's the, the impact that this has, not only in the region, but you know, for, uh, you know, as, as lessons throughout uh, the globe? Excellent point, Julio. And actually, I'll say, you know, Vanessa, on your, on your comments on, on the Mexico and the Electoral Institute, I, I was in Mexico as a 2006 as an election observer uh, when uh, uh, it was Felipe Calderon and, and AMLO and, and that. And, and I remember being there and that the Mexican electoral, the number the observers, a lot of them were not there to see how whether the process was fair, but they were actually there to learn from Mexico on how to carry out an election, right? From uh, South Korea, Japan, all over around the world, they come to Mexico to learn because Mexico was kind of best in class. Exactly. And, and so far as the way that it, I always say Mexico, the, the, the electoral system in Mexico, uh, far, far better than what we have here in the, what we have here in the United States about the, the amount of kind of rules around it, the regulations, the way it's really, really monitored. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, and also really good point on, on the, um, uh, on, on the youth who don't see, I mean, Latin America and the Caribbean is the second young, I mean, after Africa, the second, uh, 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 has second youngest, pop, second, after Africa, the largest young uh, population, 18 to, to 35 in, in the world. And so a lot of people just don't know what, it, what the alternative mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So Julio, your question, you know, why, why should we care? Um, and, and what are some of the principal causes, right? Well, I think why should why should we care? Uh, you know, some people might say, "What's well, Latin America?" You know, um, uh, let's let's focus on other other areas of the world. Well, you know, I'll I'll, I'll say that you know, Latin, what happens in Latin America and the strength of institutions in Latin America is so fundamental for U.S. Uh, security interests, national security interests, economic security interests. For the obviously the obvious reason of of we're neighbors, uh, we share a hemisphere. Uh, I'll also posit that part of the ability for U.S. power projection globally, historically, has been the fact that we live in, an, in a hemisphere where we don't have to worry about threats from our neighbors lar largely, right? But, I mean, what other country really kind of lives in, in that, in that su such a, a secure uh, neighborhood writ large? Of course, there are the you know, communist threats of, uh, of the 20th century, but, but by and large. Um, also, you know, Latin America presents um, is an economic increasing. You know, import, half of our free trade agreements are with Latin America. Um, the incredible mineral wealth that comes from Latin America, whether it's lithium, whether it's copper, um, uh, all products, all natural resources that are critical to the future uh, uh, technological needs and current technological needs of the United States. So, really important that we have democracies and governments that are, that are, that are functioning uh, functioning well. Um, and then also we see a um, continued um, uh, growth in the region from geopolitical actors uh, who's, who don't have the interests of the United States uh, in mind. And I'll point to the different ways in which Russia engages in the, in the region through disinformation campaigns versus the way that China engages in the region uh, through, um, uh, through its, its, its continued uh, uh, attempts at economic dominance and dominance of, of, of some of these mineral wealth uh, supply chains that are so critical for, for the US, uh, US future. Um, so, you know, frankly, we, 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 we ignore Latin America and the Caribbean at our own peril. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and this is, um, um, you know, I, I think uh, there's a, a growing recognition of the importance of the region. What, what are some of the principal causes? Well, one is I think that there's a, uh, there's a, a general sentiment that democracies don't deliver, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and and whether they do or don't is a different question, but there's, right. a, there's a general sentiment that, 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 that the democratic system of government is not delivering to people. And what people are concerned about in the region is less about whether there's a democracy or not, but more about their pocketbooks. Is my life better today than it was yesterday, right? They're concerned about security, 
right? I mentioned before transnational criminal organizations, right? They're concerned about being able to go out there. They're concerned about you know extortion of their businesses if you live in Ecuador, uh, increasingly, right? They're concerned about. Uh, security in Mexico is a journalist in Mexico is worried about their their security so so the the, the these fundamental issues there, there's a disconnect between the population and whether they see the democracies that govern them is actually serving the, the that that um, the, those interests um, I think that there's also you know a concern about the widespread corruption Right, and, and people see not all this, also kind of this questioning of the democratic model, but then also seeing the the, the, the vast corruption that, that will exist, whether at the local level, whether mm -hmm. at the national level, that also kind of then raises concerns uh, about it. And, and I think it was only exacerbated by the COVID pandemic, right? Because COVID was a time when people were looking at their governments to quickly be able to deliver, right? And we, you know, here in the U.S. or Europe or other parts, you know, we thought it was it was a difficult time. It was a much more difficult time if you lived in, you know, Ecuador or Argentina or pick your country in, in, in Latin America. And, you know, the medicine didn't arrive quickly, quick enough. There weren't the safety nets provided by governments to to help people deal with some of the the, the, the job fault. I mean, it's, it's a region where, you know, over, you know, most, most workers are in the informal sector. Uh, so that pro 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 provided an increased challenge because of because of COVID. So you have this, you know, the the um, uh, this is all kind of risen to then these anti-corruption populists that have uh, that you see across the region, right? Um, uh, someone like a, a Bukele in El Salvador, right? Bukele in El Salvador a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, received about 85 percent of, of the vote, right? Um, and but at the same time, this is the, the same president looking at institutions who had to massage the Constitution to be able to run again. And the same president, although the security situation has improved dramatically in, in El Salvador, the, um, the challenges to you know, basic uh, civil liberties have, have, have exacerbated. But Salvadorans saw him as responding to their basic, uh, their basic needs of improved security. So some of the more authoritarian tactics that Bukele takes are okay for most Salvadorans. You, you see that by the vote, uh, because of the improvement that he's played on, on the security situation. So these anti-corruption uh, populists, and, and then also the the, uh, the the weakened institutions that are necessary to fight corruption and also to improve um, social uh, some of the, respond to some of the so social demands uh, across the region. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, Vanessa, so you were talking about the degradation of institutions in Mexico. You talked about the uh, judiciary power. You talked about the Institute for Access of Information. Uh, what about good institutions? What's the resilience of these institutions? What are the, uh, the primary factors that, on the one hand, allow these institutions to survive, but on the other hand, also how how would you identify those vulnerabilities between the institutional framework that it's uh, that Mexico has? I think that's a very important question and goes to something that Jason was mentioning around uh, the resilience of institutions. Institutions can resist as much, no? So so first you have institutions that are being challenged no, by the discourse, uh, by uh, the fact that their legitimacy is being questioned, their sole existence is being questioned. This populistic narrative around state cap, I mean, yes, state capture and market capture of, of, of institutions, uh, then institutions are eroded. Uh, eroded in the case of Mexico, there have been attempts to change the constitution, as the one I, I was just referring to, but also to change the legislation. And also, there's other some more subtle uh, uh, ways into challenging the institution, such as budget. You have the budget, you reduce the budget. We are in an austere context, no? Uh, you pass from a austerity to austerity side, and then basically you you um, do significant damage to, to the institution. Another way to 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 do uh, to erode institutions is governance, because governance is quite interlinked to the checks and balances of the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. In many of the institutions you have mentioned, it is the executive that proposes the member of the board of the institution or the commissioner, no? And then it's the legislative that makes a decision on that and then they're appointed. 
well, if I don't make the appointment in the first place and propose it to the to the legislative, they will never get the governance they need in order to operate. So, so I so I challenge their governance as well. So there's many ways in which this uh, erosion has happened, but there are a lot of nuances. And here again, I, I would uh, uh, tend to agree with with Jason. Because it is not black and white, many of the institutions have resisted. Uh, many of the institutions have been really backstops against this uh, authoritarian uh, challenge. Uh, for instance, the fact that the government doesn't have a majority in Congress has been essential not to pass those laws that uh, go against democracy, that go against freedom, and that go against the institutions themselves. Another element has been a, a major uh, institution which has been a backstop for all these anti-constitutional attempts to, to get rid of institutions, which is the Supreme Court of Justice. So we still have a Supreme Court of Justice that is a backstop there, again, with some challenges in the very short term in relation to governance, because some of the uh, judges are going to be renewed in, in, in the near future, and that renewal, of, well, renewal of, of, their, of their governance also touches on the executive. No. Um, the Electoral Institute, we still have a, an Electoral Institute that organizes free and fair elections. We can discuss how free and how fair and how th that might be deteriorating, particularly in the challenge, in the current challenge of organized crime, participating in the electoral process uh, in, in Mexico in different ways. And the, the fact that there has been a policy around hogs, not bullets, uh, that's that's the official name uh, of, of the current policy uh, in relation to organized crime. Uh, the electoral court as well, we also have an electoral court. As, as you were saying, Mexico had a whole infra infrastructure in relation to, to organizing free and fair elections. But also, if one wants to look at, 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 at two elements, when we ask why are these leaders so uh, popular, no, we again we have to see ourselves in the mirror and we have to see the facts. I would say uh, I would point to three elements in relation to uh, the medium to low part of the pyramid in Mexico. Minimum wage in the last five years, so there's only one more year for for the um, for this administration to end, less than a year. The minimum wage has been increased 85 uh, percent, adjusted to inflation by decree. No? So people have much more uh, uh, financial resources. Second element that I would point to, uh, if you were placed in 2018, the resources, the fiscal resources and the budget to social programs, to social transfers, was 8 billion US. Today, this year, an electoral year, I would underline, is 30 billion, 3-0. And also something not attributable to the government, but still having an effect on, on, on the population, uh, uh, remittances. And mm -hmm. remittances were 34 billion in 2018, and uh, this year, last year they were 63 billion. So there, there you have an answer as to, as to why uh, uh, these governments are, are, are uh, becoming increasingly, increasingly uh, popular in, in, in some part. And I would point to, to another element that I, I, I spend a lot of years of my life in, in the Ministry of Finance, which is the Mexican economy has been quite resilient, and public finances still look good on the broader picture. If you see the broadest measure to, to, to um, analyze debt to GDP ratio, it's a very technical uh, um, measurement, which is called the public sector borrowing requirements, and the historic PSVRs, uh, in Mexico are below 50%. The average in Latin America is around 72, 73%. So the big image of, of public finances look good, look sustainable. No, We have a prudent liability management. 80% of the exposure of, of the debt is in, denominated in pesos. We have a, a, a credit line with the, with the IMF, it, where one or of, of uh, 185 countries that have that. Uh, we have historic reserves. We have a series of elements that, that in the picture look good in relation to, to public finances uh, in Mexico, although this year they're running a fiscal deficit of 5.4% of GDP, uh, uh, which is the highest in the last 33 years.
36 years. So, so deteriorating, but still a very resilient uh, public finances. And a lot has to do with a question that is going to be essential for the new government uh, that we will be in, in power as of October 1st this year, which is what to do with Pemex. No? Pemex, uh, the oil company, the national oil company, used to contribute to the public finances. Now it takes away from public finances. And that you can track to the idea of another trend, which is statization. That this is another element that uh, uh, is, is essential to understand in relation to what's going on in Mexico. Uh, statization of, of, of a series of elements, statization of, of uh, economic activity, mainly in the energy sector. And finally, another element that I would like to point out, which is militarization. Uh, militarization not only of security but militarization of ports and air, uh, airports and the, the military is building the refinery the military is building the uh, Maya train uh, the military now owns a commercial airline so this has been a trend that has been increasing over the last five years uh, sometimes more subtle sometimes more evident but that is challenging democracy, institutions, transparency, accountability, because the military is a, a security a, a part of the cabinet, and they don't necessarily stand by the uh, standards of transparency and accountability as it is the requirement in the rest of the government. So all of this mix, just to put how, how complex this, this, um, this uh, uh, analysis is, how there's positives and negatives, and how all the nuances help help us explain as to why you have a very popular president, how there are a, a huge set of challenges in relation to democratic retrenchment, but also some elements that have been backstops against these trends and an economy that is still resilient and that has been growing significantly over the last quarters, although the general uh, um, GDP growth for the whole administration is only uh, 1% way below our, our potential. Yeah. And can I ask a follow-up to that? So it, it seems to me that increasingly a strategy for authoritarianism is to erode all of these institutions by slowly replacing the public civil servants, for instance, in a, in a, in a, very, in a, in a very close example in Mexico and the, the former uh, Minister of Finance of Mexico, Carlos Ursula, used to mention this, and actually this is the, the, the actual reason why he quit, because people that were not prepared were just imposed into these uh, institutions slowly and uh, strategically. So we may not be talking about a lot of you know, institutions coming down very quickly, but rather institutions being eroded. Can I ask, what are your predictions for Mexico in, in, in terms of institutional stability and about this erosion of the institutions for the next, let's say, uh, six years and maybe you know, venture in, in terms of of you know, like uh, what you think about the administration uh, that might come into the next in, into the next election, uh, and their ability to either keep institutions alive or continue to erode them. I think that's the key question that the new president uh, of Mexico will have to to solve, and I would say she because it's going to be a she for sure that we know. Uh, the two main uh, uh, candidates are are women for for the first time in in the history of Mexico. So I would say that that is a definition that they will have to make. As I was saying, if you were standing in 2018, there was a definition that was made in relation to a new regime, and a new regime with a new conception of state, with a new conception of government, with a new conception of the relationship with the market, and with a new conception with, uh, in, in relation to the, to, to, to the society as a whole. So what kind of, of a state does the new government uh, aim to have? What kind of checks and balances in relation to the executive, the legislative, the judiciary, the independent and technical institutions? Those are the key questions that we need to ask the candidates uh, because the, 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 the proper campaigns uh, start on, on March the 1st. So this is a first uh, um, question that they need to answer and they need to propose to the Mexican uh, electorate. Uh, there are a series of governance challenges that regardless of who runs Mexico, they will have to face. And, and one of them, besides this very key uh, existential definition, I would say that it is 
how to deal with organized crime. What are you going to do after the hogs not bullets a, a policy for six years? No, and the huge power that organized crime has gained in, in, in Mexico. So you will have to have that definition of the first governance challenge. No, the second one I would say is is um, Congress. They will have a very complex Congress in relation not only to the opposition but their own coalitions. No, uh, having you, you know in, in in the one hand uh, the three parties, the most important parties in Mexico, being in a single coalition for the first time, no? There's a left-wing party, there's a center-left party, and there's a right-wing party. You would have to govern with that. How do you do that? That's that's a governance challenge, if that's one case. In the other case, you would have a party that is not a party, but it's a movement, and the former president being part of that. How do you handle that, no? So, so that is a, another governance challenge. Uh, I would also add the challenge uh, um, of uh, all the, you know, the institutional a, a, a retrenchment and, and democracy, how do you go uh, along with that? How do you uh, go along also with the military? Uh, the military, as I was saying, has gained significant power. What kind of relationship with the new government have with the military? Will you keep on giving them uh, all of these spaces and, and, and activities in the economic front or take that away from them? This is going to be a, also a, a very important governance challenge. And I would also point to, to something that is key, which is the relationship with the U.S. In the context of more migration, in the context of the crisis of, of fentanyl, in the context of what I call nearshoring 2.0, because we already had the nearshoring 1.0, which was called NAFTA, and which was called USMCA. That was the first wave of nearshoring since the 1990s in Mexico. But we have a new wave of nearshoring. So if we want to uh, make the most out of our competitiveness about being North American, about being the first trading partner of the U.S., the first source of imports uh, to the U.S., one of the first five trading partners for 35 of the 50 states in the U.S., if we want to make the most out of this, then we need to redefine uh, our competitiveness, our productivity matrix, our growth matrix, and the relationship with the United States as well. And Jason, talking about this relationship with the United States, it seems to me that uh, we have a lot of flavors in terms of, you know, like the degrees of authoritarianism mm -hmm. that we are seeing in Latin America. On the one hand, we have uh, the likes of Bukele, for instance, or the recent transformation of what seems to be giving a very dark turn in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. um, on the other end, we have uh, governments that, are like the government in Uruguay, or like the government in Chile, which cannot be, uh, by any reasonable measure, characterized as authoritarianism. It, it, it seems to me that all of these flavors emerge because now we have a many to choose from which, you know, like we, uh, for, for, for the alliances that we are actually forming. We can just go, as, as a Latin American country, we can just go and pick China, pick uh, some uh, a model of authoritarianism, uh, rather than the, the, the Western uh, model, if we, we, we like to call it like that, or we can call it, uh, or we can just go and pick the Western model. Now, let's call it, we have a menu as Latin America from which to pick. What do you think should be the strategy for, you know, like our, uh, uh, the the, the non-authoritarian model mm -hmm. to prevail ultimately. Julia, when you said flavors, I started thinking ice cream. And I was thinking uh, <laughs> cook, cookie dough or, or, or chocolate <laughs> mint or, or whatnot. Um, the uh, um, you know when I when I look, you know what you have in the region is you have you know you have straight up authoritarian leaders, right? Like Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela or uh, Ortega in, in, in Nicaragua, of course, uh, of course, Cuba. Uh, and then you have, you know, Demo you know, then you have um, Demo you know, authoritarian leaders who are cloaked as democratic leaders, right? Or that kind of de the democratic cloaking, and 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 uh, and then you have then you have other countries. You mentioned Chile and others where, uh, you know, Chile is a great example, right? It's a great example of a country where there is work, you know, across ideological spectrum. The tragic passing a couple of weeks ago of former President um, Sebastián Piñera, who actually received a award for his environmental work for the Atlantic Council about five years ago, but his passing, you know, at the funeral, you had all the, you know, living uh, Chilean presidents who 
where the physical condition to be there across different ideologies uh, to come and, and there's a photo next to the former president's uh, casket. And so you have, you know, uh, you know, President Borch in Chile has shown himself to be kind of what could be kind of a, a the new trend of what a, kind of a new leftist leaders could could, could a prag, the pragmatic you know leader from the left could could present. What could be done to strengthen institutions, right? And and what, where are there those opportunities? Um, we have six minutes. I have six six points. Now I'll make them a little quicker. But but the but I think when I, so the six things to, to strengthen institutions. One one is I think that we, to to really this goes to the to the work that we just released yesterday. We need to really strengthen the part the U.S. partnership with the region. Uh, you know we need to meet our partners in the region not with rhetoric but with but with but with actual deliverables as well because that is that is the, that is the new reality right because you know china comes and and has they have money on the table they have specific things that they're they're willing to offer and and of course you know the uh, us values need to be continued to to uh, put forward but also specific things you know things like the development finance corporation right the way the build act is written is you know, there's only a handful of countries across latin america who who qualify for dfc financing does that make sense no because they're most mostly are qualified as middle income countries so things like our, some of our, our toolbox needs the us toolbox needs to be updated and adapted so that we can be a stronger partner with, with the region. Um, there needs to be a greater focus on reducing corruption, and, and as Vanessa was mentioning in the case of Mexico, decreasing corruption and increasing transparency. Um, you know, my concern is that as you have in, increased, uh, again, Chinese uh, uh, economic interests in the region, uh, China doesn't have a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, right? China, they're, they're, so there, there are, there are, there are there, the, the nature of the way in which Chinese investment comes into the region, even if, it, even if the in, in, initial intention is not to perpetuate corruption, the way in which the, the, the investment comes can help to lead to uh, 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 greater corruption. And so we need to reduce that corruption. Um, I think on, on those lines, um, things like incorporating technology more into governance is a way to be able to show transparency in governance, a way to make government processes uh, more efficient and to show that democracies are actually delivering. Uh, education is absolutely fundamental. Uh, you know, an educated labor force will allow uh, uh, allow allow us in, in, in Latin America to ensure that this newest um, um, uh, technological revolution doesn't leave the region further behind and uh, leave the region more unequal than, than it currently is. Um, more economic opportunities. There needs to be more opportunities for formal former, former labor uh, uh, labor force creation, um, and 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 overall uh, greater inclusion. Right. The the the, the, the difference between the haves and the have-nots across this hemisphere has only increased in in in, the, in, in, in prior years. As that as that divide continues to increase, there will be um, a greater threats to institutions and a, gr a greater sense that the form of government. Uh, that is that is you know, the best form of government that we know. Uh, there will be a greater concern about whether that government, whether those government, whether those democratic governments are actually able to, to, to uh, deliver. And very quickly, a question for uh, both of you. We have to answer really in one minute. So it seems that Latin America is destined not to leave the middle income trap. Uh, what do you think are the prospects for growth uh, in Latin America? I, I think what's going to be incredibly important is to increase on the improve on the value chain. Right, and so where the where, where the, there's a huge opportunity, you know, Brazil is an agricultural provider to the world. Uh, Argentina has incredible agricultural um, uh, uh, oil and gas potential. Other countries have that potential. Guyana, for example, discovering incredible new oil reserves. Um, uh, I mentioned the uh, lithium, uh, Bolivia, copper, and in, in, in Chile. But how the key is going to be to these are all commodities that the world needs. So not just being an exporter of commodities, which is what we've talked about for quite some time. This is not a new discussion for the region, but how to, how to improve upon that value chain to make sure that the uh, higher end products are actually being uh, delivered. We recently hosted a delegation here from the Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic is very interested in becoming a, a source for the semiconductor industry, right? Uh, so working in partnership to provide those opportunities can help to, uh, at the same time, provide not only economic prosperity, but then also strengthen uh, democratic institutions. And Vanessa, what do you think about Mexico's prospects? Very, very briefly, I think that there is a global trend in relation to 
geopolitics in the one hand uh, presenting challenges, but also opportunities no, in what is happening in the world in relation to Latin America and relation to Mexico. Uh, there is this nearshoring trend that I was referring to at this point in time, in the, case, in the case of Mexico, much more an expectation effect rather than a concrete materialization effect, but it's moving towards that direction. Uh, but we need to understand the very contextual growth determinants in each of the countries. What uh, will make Mexico leave that uh, uh, middle-income uh, trap? What would create more solid foundations, more productivity, more competitiveness in order to be able to grow to potential, grow to potential, not 1%, but 4%, no? Uh, and that is clear. It has to be the rule of law. It has to be access to social rights. We uh, were one of the countries that first introduced the multidimensional measurement of poverty. We have that policy anchor, and that policy anchor is food and nutrition, uh, education, um, housing, services to housing, health, infrastructure. We need to, to, to abide to that standard and that anchor in order to create good public policy. But we will not be able to create good public policy if we not solve first the, uh, uh, the need to have solid functional institutions that deliver. If institutions do not deliver, then democracy will always be seen as something hybrid, as something ethereal that is not bringing a positive change for families and positive change for individuals. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this was our panel on institutional retrenchment and growth in Latin America. I will pass the baton back to Dan. Uh, Dan, back to you. So, um, um, thank you very much, Jason. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Thank you very much, Julio. I want to start by congratulating those of you who showed tremendous stamina, and you are still here at the end of the day after we started at 9 in the morning. There is no prize, but my, you have our thanks, and I hope uh, the, uh, the discussions were illuminating. Um, our proceedings um, are recorded. Uh, they will be available on our website. Um, we've been extraordinarily, um, extraordinarily, extraordinarily fortunate to have excellent panelists, excellent moderators, and also excellent scholars who came to us and shared with them, with us, uh, uh, the research. Some of it completed, and 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 some of it in um, in draft form. Uh, but we are very grateful for the quality of the discussion that we've had today. As I mentioned before, <clears throat> our first issue of the annual Atlas is available on our website for download. In two months, we'll have the new edition of our indexes. And this then will represent the main effort for our center this year in what we consider the analytical side of our work. The emphasis for the rest of the year would be what we call the advocacy side of our work. What we don't want to be is an ivory tower here in Washington where we think big thoughts and smart people get together and um, you know, touch their chin and think about stuff and make. We want to change things on the ground. We want to, th to see things improved. We want to see our indexes and our analysis used for positive change. And we do, uh, we do this by empowering, with our analytical work, two types of uh, constituencies in the main area of, our, uh, of emphasis of our work, uh, which is in developing countries. On the one hand, in civil society, we want to give, say, think tanks or other organizations the data, the facts. So they can go to their governments and to their legislature and say, look, our country is ranked 130th because it is uh, ranked here in freedom and here in prosperity. How about we move up a little bit? And here is a concrete proposal on how to change one thing or another. The other constituency that we have are people in government and in the legislature who want to cause change and maybe need help from our indexes to see the levers 
for change. Because in each of our sub-indexes on freedom, economic freedom, political freedom, legal freedom, we have several indicators. So in economic freedom, they may say, well, maybe we don't rank so well because we don't have property rights that are great. Or we are not doing well on women empowerment, or we are not doing well in trade, or in political rights, on, or, or other categories like that. So then we show them concrete things to people who are well-intentioned, and they want to do these things. So um, we uh, hope that we still have in our, uh, in our virtual audience some people who are still with us, showing the same stamina as the, I would say, 40 people here in the room. Send us your ideas. We would like to, to, uh, to, to discuss them with you and to see how our work together uh, can improve things for the better. So thank you very much, everybody. And for those who are here um, in person, we have a reception in the, in the boardroom. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.